You're a professional and you need a laptop that can keep up with your fast paced lifestyle. However, laptops never measure up to their desktop counterparts, so you're always compromising on power, speed, and battery life in the name of portability. You're used to dealing with spinning wheels and freezing screens and you've grown accustomed to constantly searching for a power outlet. You've even started to bring your desktop computer with you on business trips. I'm looking at you, Marquez. You've tried every laptop out there and you're tired of having to make compromise after compromise. Then something changes. A new laptop is released that promises to be different and you keep hearing that it actually lives up to the hype. You try it and discover that it is, in fact, the best laptop for pros ever made. That computer is the MacBook Pro and what's crazy is that it was released back in 2021 and Apple just made it even better. Let's talk about it. Last week, Apple announced the availability of updated 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros, packing new M2 Pro and M2 Max chips, making them even more powerful than they already were. Apple sent over this 16 inch M2 Max model that I've been testing. Inside the box, you'll basically find three things. Obviously there's the MacBook Pro itself, the 140 watt charging adapter, which can fast charge this laptop, more on that later, and the braided MagSafe charging cable. Oh, and if you love Apple stickers, of course, there's one in here too. Now there's a lot to these new machines, which I'll get to in the full review, so be sure you're subscribed for that. But in the meantime, if you're interested, I will have links to these down in the description below if you wanna check them out for yourself. That said, let's start by talking about the features you need to know about starting with the design. If you didn't pick up the 2021 model, then you'll want to be aware that the ports have been brought back to the MacBook Pro. I'm talking about the return of the SD card slot, which is something every creative professional who I know uses. The return of HDMI, which is something I rarely use, but in corporate environments is a must have for presentations. And this new model can connect to TVs and displays at up to 4K with a 240 Hertz refresh rate and even 8K TVs at 60 Hertz. There's also the return of MagSafe, which supports fast charging the MacBook Pro, giving you 50% charge in just 30 minutes. There's even a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack that includes advanced support for high impedance headphones and three USB-C ports that are now Thunderbolt 4. The Magic Keyboard saw changes too with the removal of the touch bar, which has been replaced with full-size function keys, including a key for quick toggling do not disturb. There's also a 1080p FaceTime camera now, which I'm mentioning in the design portion of the video, because it's in this display cutout. This is how Apple made the borders at the top thinner by wrapping it around the camera module. But speaking of that display, let's talk about it. There are two sizes of the new MacBook Pro, 14.2 inches with a resolution of 3024 by 1964 and 16.2 inches at a 3456 by 2234 resolution. Both sizes use the same mini LED technology that Apple ships on the 12.9 inch iPad Pro offering much better local dimming when compared to previous LED displays. And these are also ProMotion displays, which allow for adaptive refresh rates at up to 120 Hertz. They'll automatically adjust based on what you're doing. So if you're scrolling or playing a game, you can expect the refresh rate to increase. But if you're reading a static document, the refresh rate will imperceptibly drop, which is a bonus for your battery life. It'll also offer the option for users to set locked in refresh rates, which is important for video editing and other use cases that rely on specific screen settings. Now these mini LED screens can put out a thousand nits of sustained brightness with 1600 nits peak brightness for HDR content. For reference, the last Intel MacBook Pro topped out at 500 nits. The display is so good that it's hard not to call it the most impressive feature, but then there's the performance. On the real, Apple Silicon is out here shining. Apple introduced the two most powerful chips it's ever created for its laptops in the M2 Pro and M2 Max. These are more powerful versions of the M2 chip that we saw launch in the entry level 13 inch MacBook Pro and redesigned MacBook Air last summer and those were already impressive. While the M2 Pro is the baseline chip for the MacBook Pro, you can upgrade to the M2 Max for even more performance. And that's the version I've been testing here. 
So let's talk about that chip. The M2 Max takes the already impressive M2 architecture to an even higher level. It supports up to 400 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth and up to 96 gigabytes of RAM. Yes, Apple is about to have you out here walking around town with a laptop with 96 gigabytes of RAM in it. That's the most ever in a laptop chip. This is unified memory, which allows the CPU and GPU to share a single pool of memory, which means your GPU has access to way more than the typical 16 gigabytes you'd find on a dedicated laptop graphics chip. For those who work with video, the industry leading media engine and ProRes acceleration means you can play back up to 43 streams of 4K ProRes or 10 streams of 8K ProRes video while preserving CPU and GPU power. The M2 Max sports a 12 core CPU with eight high performance cores and four efficiency cores, and you can get the GPU with up to 38 cores, giving you 30% faster GPU performance than the M1 Max from the previous model, which brings me to gaming. And I know it's weird to talk about gaming in a Mac video, but I played Resident Evil Village on the M2 Max MacBook Pro, and as you can see here in the Metal Performance HUD, the game ran perfectly. The Metal Performance HUD, by the way, is an on-screen overlay that allows you to monitor gameplay performance with real-time stats and logging, memory usage, resolution, CPU and GPU render time, and frame presentation deadlines. Just Google it and you can see how you can turn it on for yourself. I wanted to get a feel for what the M2 Max can do, so I bumped all the settings to maximum at a resolution of 1440p with Metal FX upscaling quality mode enabled. And as you can see, the game was hitting about 140 to 175 frames per second, again at max settings. Then I decided to really tax the system by changing the resolution of the game to 3456 by 2234. That's the full resolution of the MacBook Pro's display. Now without Metal FX upscaling enabled, it hovered around 80 to 90 frames per second in this mode, which was surprising, but even more so. Re-enabling Metal Effects upscaling quality mode brought it to 110 frames per second. That's maximum resolution at maximum settings and the MacBook Pro handled it like a beast. One other bump in performance this year, Apple has upgraded the latest MacBook Pros to Wi-Fi 6E like they did with the latest M2 based iPad Pros. You'll need a Wi-Fi 6E router to take advantage of the new speeds which are up to twice as fast when compared to the previous generation. Up next, let's talk about one of the most impressive stats about the new MacBook Pro, battery life. The dream is to be able to carry around your laptop without having to worry about also bringing the charger with you everywhere you go. And that dream was achieved when Apple released its M1 laptops, but the 2023 16-inch MacBook Pros take it to another level giving users up to 22 hours of video playback, which is the longest battery life ever on a Mac, and 15 hours of wireless web browsing, which is a three hour increase from the fastest Intel-based MacBook Pro. The power efficient design of Apple Silicon allows for the same level of performance, whether you're plugging in or running on battery. And when it comes to charging, the 140 watt power adapter for the 16 inch model will charge the battery again to 50% in just 30 minutes. Next, we need to talk about sound. The MacBook Pro includes a high fidelity six speaker sound system with a force canceling woofer and wide stereo sound, along with a studio quality three microphone array with a high signal to noise ratio and directional beam forming. Now, Apple has been at the top of the computational audio game, in my opinion, as we've seen the company do some amazing things with the sounds coming from AirPods and the iPhone and iPads built in speakers and the previous generation MacBook Pro. The speaker array also supports spatial audio when playing music or video with Dolby Atmos, creating a three-dimensional soundstage that sounds incredible. There are no better speakers on a laptop than what you'll find on the 16-inch MacBook Pro in particular. The MacBook Pro gives you performance and battery life like never before. You can configure your 14 or 16-inch with the latest M2 Pro or M2 Max chip for ultimate power efficiency and long-lasting battery life. So whether you're a developer, photographer, filmmaker, 3D artist, scientist, music producer, or anything in between, this is the laptop that will take your creativity to the next level. For years, the Mac Mini has been the entry-level desktop computer for Apple enthusiasts. It was a compact and affordable option for those who wanted the power of a Mac without breaking the bank. The Mac Mini is known for its small form factor, 
easy setup and affordability. But it was often considered underpowered compared to its bigger brother, the iMac. It was a popular choice for those who needed a basic computer for everyday tasks such as browsing, email, and document editing. But with the introduction of the new M2 Pro chip, the Mac Mini has transcended its entry-level status and entered the realm of high-performance computing. For the first time, the Mac Mini now has the power of a MacBook Pro, and that's a game changer. I've been using the new Mac Mini with M2 Pro chip for several days now, and I am seriously impressed. And this form factor, alongside the power of the M2 chip, is the reason why. If you wanna pick up the new Mac Mini for yourself, I will leave a link down in the description below. But for now, let's get started by talking about this design. The new Mac Mini maintains the same compact and minimalist design as the previous model. It's a silver squircle measuring 1.41 inches in height by 7.75 inches in width and depth and weighing in at just 2.82 pounds. On the back, you'll find a variety of ports, including four Thunderbolt 4 ports with support for speeds up to 40 gigabits per second, two USB-A ports, an HDMI port that supports 4K at up to 240 hertz or 8K at 60 hertz, a gigabit ethernet port that you can optionally configure up to 10 gigabit and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack that supports high impedance headphones and line out for amplified speakers. When it comes to wireless connectivity, the Mac mini has been upgraded with support for Wi-Fi 6E, allowing for twice the speed of the previous models as well as Bluetooth 5.3. Next, let's talk about performance. While the Mac mini is available in both M2 and M2 Pro configurations, I'll be specifically talking about the M2 Pro model that I've been using. This one has the M2 Pro with a 12 core CPU, 19 core GPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and a one terabyte SSD. Now, as I mentioned, the M2 Pro brings pro level performance to the Mac mini for the first time. It's built around a faster unified memory system with up to 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, supporting up to 32 gigabytes of memory. The M2 Pro chip in this one has eight high performance cores and four high efficiency cores, delivering up to 1.9 times more performance than the M1 model. And the GPU here delivers up to 2.6 times more graphics performance than the M1. More on that shortly. One thing I personally love as someone who works with video on a daily basis is the M2 Pro's media engine, which accelerates video encode and decode. Video editing is almost 20 times faster on this Mac mini when compared to the fastest Core i7 Intel model and about three times faster than the M1 model, which is an insane leap in generation to generation performance. And even if you aren't a video editor like I am, on the whole, the Mac mini with M2 Pro is up to 14 times faster than the fastest Intel based Mac mini. So it can handle demanding workflows with ease from photo and video editing to gaming. Yes, let's talk about gaming for a moment. This is interesting because I don't think I've ever talked about gaming in any Mac review that I've done over the past 17 years that I've been doing this job, with the exception of my review of the new MacBook Pro, which you can check out on my channel as well. But I digress. Gaming performance on the Mac mini with the M2 Pro chip is up to 15 times faster than the fastest Intel-based Mac mini. So that just means gaming is on a whole nother level here. With the new Metal 3 technologies like Metal Effects upscaling, we're getting more immersive visuals, faster performance, and quicker loading in games. Pairing your favorite game controller makes gaming on the Mac more convenient too. One game I was particularly interested in testing on the new Mac mini was Resident Evil Village, a game I'm very familiar with from playing it on the Xbox Series X. It's one of the first games to use Metal Effects upscaling, delivering incredibly responsive gameplay with high frame rates and beautiful visuals. I played Resident Evil Village in HD on the M2 Pro Mac mini, and as you can see here in the Metal Performance HUD, the game ran smoothly with no hiccups. The Metal Performance HUD, by the way, is an on-screen overlay that allows you to monitor gameplay performance with real-time stats and logging, memory usage, resolution, CPU and GPU render times, and frame presentation deadlines. I started with the prioritized graphics option at 1080p, and as you can see, the game was hitting about 115 to 140 frames per second. Then I went in and enabled Metal Effects upscaling quality mode, and things jumped to around 140 to 165 frames per second. And lastly, I then decided to switch the resolution to 2560 by 1440, that being the maximum resolution supported by the studio display, and bumped everything up to max settings. Now, I would have expected this to bring a Mac mini to its knees. But instead, as you can see, the game continued to play at about 60 to 80 frames per second. This is playing 
on a computer that weighs less than three pounds and is under an inch and a half tall. That's just incredible. I also tried NBA 2K as well from Apple Arcade, which stayed at a locked and smooth 60 frames per second. Now to be clear, I wouldn't buy the Mac mini if I was looking to purchase a dedicated gaming machine. That isn't its primary purpose and you can definitely do better elsewhere if gaming is your primary or only need. However, what we are seeing here is that the Mac mini is now more than capable of holding its own when it comes to gaming as one of the many things in its arsenal of features. And that brings us to our final point, price. Apple has dropped the price for the M2 Mac mini when compared to the M1. The entry level Mac mini with M2 chip starts at $599, a decrease of $100, while the pro model I've been talking about will set you back at $1299. Now that might seem like a lot, but when you factor in how much performance it has, compared to Intel or even M1 based Mac minis, it's actually a very good deal. Overall, the new Mac mini maintains its sleek, compact and minimalist design, making it a great option for those who have limited space or are looking for a portable desktop. The variety of connections and ports allow for easy connection to a variety of peripherals. The wireless capabilities are also improved, providing faster and more efficient connectivity. It's small, but it packs a punch enabling a wide range of pros from creators to scientists, developers to engineers, and even gamers to unlock new workflows that just weren't doable on the Mac mini before. The original HomePod was released by Apple in 2018, but was discontinued in 2021. Despite being well-reviewed for its sound quality, the original HomePod struggled to gain market share against competitors such as the Amazon Echo and Google Home, due in part to its higher price point and limited functionality compared to those devices. Since then, we've had the HomePod mini serving as Apple's smart music speaker. Speaker. But there hasn't been anything in the market that's been able to match up to the sound quality of the original HomePod until now. This is the new second generation HomePod and I am so glad that it's here. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check it out for yourself, but for now, let's talk about it. Let's start with the design. The new second generation HomePod has been designed to complement any space with its elegant and modern look. It comes in two colors. There's white along with a new midnight color. You won't be able to really tell it apart from the space gray of the previous generation, but Apple does say that this is definitely a new hue. The HomePod is wrapped in a seamless mesh fabric that looks great in your home and was specifically designed for its acoustic performance. The fabric is made from recycled materials, reducing environmental impact. On top, the HomePod now features a touch surface that illuminates from edge to edge making it easy to access quick controls and adjust volume, play and pause music, and also activate Siri. The touch surface also illuminates differently depending on your request, showing a white pulse when playing media, a multicolor view when Siri is activated, and a green indicator when a phone call is active or sound recognition check-in is in progress, and more on that later. If you're curious about the dimensions, the new HomePod is 6.6 .6 inches in height, 5.6 inches in width, and weighs in at 5.16 pounds. Next, let's talk about sound quality. This is the most important section because it's what sets the HomePod apart from the HomePod mini. The larger HomePod exists in order to provide much better sound quality. And if it failed there, there'd be no reason to buy it when the mini can do everything else. And I'm so very happy to say that the HomePod thrives in this area. The HomePod features a number of advanced audio technologies that work together to deliver truly remarkable sound quality. One of the key features is the high excursion woofer, which uses a powerful motor to drive the diaphragm and produce rich, deep bass. Additionally, an internal bass EQ microphone dynamically adjusts the low frequencies to ensure that they're balanced and consistent. The HomePod also features a beam forming array of five tweeters, which are specifically designed to produce stunning high frequencies. These tweeters are specialized for high pitched notes and use custom transducers, horns, and neodymia magnets to ensure all the details of the music come through with clarity. To further enhance the audio experience, the HomePod also uses advanced computational audio, which is powered by the Apple S7 chip. This allows the HomePod to adjust its sound in real time based on the environment and what's being played. Room sensing technology is also used to measure the sound reflections off neighboring surfaces so that the HomePod can adapt its sound to the room that it's in. I tested a variety of songs and the HomePod performed 
beautifully. From the intricate guitar work and layered harmonies of the Eagles Hotel California to the pulsing beats and soaring vocals of The Weeknd's Blinding Lights, the HomePod delivered each song's unique elements with clarity and precision. The deep bass and crisp high frequencies in Beck's Morning were particularly impressive. One of the most striking demonstrations of the HomePod sound quality was when I played Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. The complexity of the song's structure and instrumentation was handled with ease by the HomePod's advanced computational audio. The sound was fully immersive with vocals and harmonies seemingly coming from all directions. To fully experience the HomePod's capabilities, I also listened to Apple's Made for Spatial Audio playlist, and it was a truly remarkable experience. That playlist obviously includes songs made for spatial audio, which the HomePod supports. The sound was fully immersive and makes you feel like you're right in the middle of the music. It's an uncanny feeling to stand in front of the HomePod looking right at it while it's playing music and to your ears, music is coming from all sorts of different directions, not just from this device that's in front of you. Overall, the HomePod's woofer, tweeters, computational audio, room sensing tech, and internal bass EQ all work together to deliver great sound quality with rich deep bass and amazing high frequencies, making it perfect for enjoying music the way it was intended to be. Overall, the HomePod offers an unparalleled audio experience that is sure to impress even the most discerning of music lovers. But that's one HomePod, which leads me to using multiple HomePods. Using multiple HomePods will enhance your listening experience in several ways, because one of the best things you can do with a HomePod is create a stereo pair with a second HomePod. This allows for a wider and more immersive soundstage. Once the second speaker is added, not only is the bass deeper and richer, but your music will fill an even larger space. To set up a stereo pair, you can simply open the Home app on your iPhone, iPad, or Mac and follow the prompts to add a second HomePod to the room. Once paired, the HomePods will automatically separate the left and right channels. Every single song I tested obviously sounded better in this configuration versus just one standalone HomePod, but what surprised me is that it sounds way better. Like in my opinion, two HomePods sounds more than twice as good. Multi-room audio allows you to play music on multiple HomePod speakers throughout your home, all in perfect sync. So you can play the same music in every room or even a different song in different rooms, all controlled by your voice with simple commands like, yo Siri, play jazz in the kitchen or yo Siri, play my favorites playlist everywhere. Wait a minute, I didn't realize that saying yo Siri would actually activate Siri. Apologies to everyone out there. This feature also works with AirPlay enabled speakers or TVs, creating a whole home sound system that gives you the flexibility to control the audio experience in every room, even in rooms that don't have a home pod. With multi-room audio, you can easily enjoy music, podcasts, and audiobooks in any room of your home, making it perfect for parties, gatherings, or just everyday use. Then there's intercom on HomePod and HomePod Mini, which is a convenient way to communicate and stay connected to other members of your household. You can send an intercom message from one home HomePod speaker to another in a different room or to all HomePod speakers throughout your home. And it's also easy to respond just by telling Siri you want to reply. Intercom works with iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, and even CarPlay, allowing you to extend your home intercom system anywhere. Next, let's talk about Siri. I use Siri on the HomePod as a digital assistant that helps me stay on top of my day-to-day -day tasks and activities. Now, I'm sure you all know this by now, but you can ask Siri to do things like check the weather, set timers or alarms, and get a news update without having to pick up your phone. One of the best things about Siri on the HomePod is that it can recognize up to six different voices, allowing each member of the household to have their own personalized experience. This means that each person can check their own calendar, call people in their own contacts, create a reminder in their own reminders app, find their individual iPhone, and more. Overall, Siri on the HomePod is a powerful and versatile personal assistant that can make your life easier and more convenient in many ways. And that brings me to smart home integration because the HomePod also acts as a home hub, supporting matter and integrating a thread radio, connecting to the smart accessories in your home and allowing you to control your smart home while you're away. With that matter support, an even wider variety of accessories made by some of the most popular smart home brands can now be controlled with the HomePod. This means both matter and home kit compatible accessories can be seamlessly and securely used together to create scenes and automations that enable you to manage and stay connected to your home at any time. 
The HomePod also offers powerful smart home capabilities that allow you to control all of your smart home accessories with just your voice. So you can say, Siri, turn on the lights or set the thermostat to 72 degrees. The HomePod also includes built-in temperature and humidity sensing, sound recognition to identify smoke or carbon monoxide alarms, and ambient sounds integrated into scenes and automations to help you relax and focus and more on sound recognition in just a bit. The built-in temperature and humidity sensor can measure the temperature of the room it's placed in and can be used to set automation. So for example, when the temperature in the living room rises above 75 degrees, the blinds can close to keep the sunlight out. And again, you can use Siri to set up automations like lower the blinds every night at dusk, creating your ideal environment. HomePods also offer ambient sounds that can be added to scenes, automations, and alarms for more relaxation. Ambient sounds have been completely remastered with even higher fidelity in detail. Now let's go back to talking about sound recognition. Sound recognition is a feature of the HomePod that allows it to listen for smoke or carbon monoxide alarms and send a notification to your iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch if one is heard. This feature can give you greater peace of mind, especially when you're away from home. When sound recognition is activated, the HomePod will constantly listen for alarms and send a notification to your connected devices if one is detected. The notification will include a sound clip of the alarm so you can confirm whether it's a real emergency or not. Additionally, sound recognition will also show a banner at the top of the Home app and you can tap on the notification on your iPhone or the banner to check in and hear what's going on. If there's a camera in that same space, then the video feed is conveniently included in that notification too. Users can set which rooms in the home have alarms that should be listened for and can also adjust the sensitivity of the feature to minimize false alarms. And that brings us to the Apple ecosystem. The HomePod is designed to seamlessly integrate with Apple devices. So these include the iPhone, the iPad, and Apple TV 4K. This allows for a variety of convenient features and functionality, such as being able to control what's playing on the HomePod using Siri or using the iPhone or iPad to control the music on the HomePod. When paired with an Apple TV 4K, the HomePod can also enhance the audio experience and supports surround sound formats such as Dolby Atmos and Dolby Digital. Additionally, the HomePod also supports AirPlay, which allows for easy streaming and control of audio playback from other Apple devices. The HomePod also has additional proximity controls that allow for personalized music and podcast suggestions and the ability to control what's playing when an iPhone is brought close to it. With handoff, users can also keep listening to music, podcasts, or calls from their iPhone to the HomePod and vice versa when their U1 enabled iPhone is brought near, which is very cool. The HomePod is a powerful and versatile smart speaker that is designed to work seamlessly with your Apple devices. It's high fidelity sound quality and advanced audio technology make it a great option for music enthusiasts while it's built in Siri functionality allows for control and interaction with your other Apple devices. Overall, the HomePod is a great option for those primarily looking for a premium experience in their smart speaker. If that isn't you, then the HomePod mini can do just about everything that the larger HomePod can do at a fraction of the price. But if you're an audiophile, this is the best sounding smart speaker you can buy at this price point, and the stereo pair will blow you away. Today, I'm gonna be talking with Apple about the Mac and Apple Silicon, specifically the recently released M2 Pro Mac mini and the M2 Pro and Max MacBook Pros, as well as Apple's approach to designing and developing its chips. Now in my M2 Max MacBook Pro review, I mentioned that it's the best laptop available for pros. So I am super excited for this conversation. I've got Laura Metz, the Director of Product Marketing, Anand Shimpi from Hardware Technologies, and Tuba Yalchin, a 3D effects and pro workflow expert joining me. So let's jump in. Hey guys, it's great to see you. First of all, I just wanna thank you uh, for your time today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having us. All right, before we jump into some of the details, I wanna find out from each of you guys, how did you get into using Apple products or the Mac in particular? What's your origin story there? Well, my first experience using a Mac was in high school and it came, I was I had to use a, a Mac that the school provided to start scholarship applications. And so that was my first experience jumping in on word processing and, and using a Mac there. And then it actually wasn't until, unfortunately or fortunately, until I started working at Apple nearly 20 years ago uh, that I fully switched to a Mac and, and made that part of my daily life. And of course, have never looked back. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I, I think early on in school, I was exposed to kind of Apple computers. I had a, uh, an Apple IIe at home a long, long time ago. But, you know, in my adult life, uh, it was kind of 
kind of college when I, I really got into the Mac. I remember I was taking a kind of a compiler architecture class and the Mac was dip- disproportionately represented in that auditorium. And I remember like looking over at, at people next to me and they were doing all this really cool stuff on, on the Mac and that ultimately uh, kind of piqued my curiosity. And that's how I, I ended up picking one up uh, kind of in the early 2000s. And yeah, for me, it was always a MacBook Pro. I, I really liked what it represented. It was which it was a device for the creatives. And I felt like having one, you know, being a creative was like the lifestyle choice I was making committed to my creativity. And I think when the iPhone was launched, I thought like, oh, the iPhone and the Mac, these are the ecosystem, like the power tools um, that will enable me. So obviously I'm talking to three different people at Apple from three different teams. And it was probably on purpose that it was set up this way because that's how you guys design products in the first place. Apple doesn't just buy different components from different manufacturers and put them all into one product and then ship it. Instead, it's really different teams that all come together to make and form the final product. So could you guys tell me how that process works behind the scenes? We really do create our products using a a very collaborative approach across many different disciplines, whether that's, you know, from design, hardware, software engineering. Uh, We've got Anand with with hardware technologies here and our pro workflow team, which we believe is very unique to, to Apple. And I wouldn't even say we start a project. It's like the projects don't end. We might ship a product, but we're constantly communicating. And that those same conversations, they just continue on to the next uh, as we continue to innovate and move things forward. I will agree with the, um, Laura's comment. Um, as a pro workflow team, we really need to work collaboratively across different um, teams at Apple because it's everyone coming together and making these changes happen. It's super collaborative and it's really nice to see the efforts of that collaboration when you know the display team was part of something and then the GPU team was part of something and the OS team was part of it. It really uh, makes a difference and I think that's why you know, some of the features we bring shows that and I think the users also appreciate it that it's not just one thing that's been great, it's everything all together being gelled perfectly. Yeah, the Silicon team doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? Like I think when when these products are being envisioned and, and, and designed, folks on the, the architecture team, the design team, they're there. They're aware of, you know, where we're going, what's important, uh, both from a workload perspective as well as the things that are most important to enable in, in all of these designs. Uh, and so, yeah, no, I'd, I'd echo the same thing. It is very collaborative. That makes sense. And as a creative myself, I still remember my first real interaction with a Mac This is about 17 years ago, walking into an Apple store. And what caught my attention when I was playing with the Mac was I minimized the window and it kind of genied down into the dock. And I was almost taken aback by that action because it was so different. Just that interaction felt so different from what I was used to on the PC side of things. And it made me just want to explore the Mac and Mac OS more. So I literally walked out of that Apple store with a Mac mini, the first Mac mini, and I haven't looked back ever since. So needless to say, I'm a big Mac fan and I'm excited to get into it. Let's start with the design of some of the products that you just launched. Obviously there is the new M2 Mac mini, but I'm focusing more on the MacBook Pro with this question. You just launched the M2 Max and M2 Pro MacBook Pros. And at the beginning of this design generation, if you will, we saw the return of things like different ports and MagSafe. Now, Apple in the past has never been a company that shied away from dropping what it considered to be legacy ports or legacy technologies. But here we saw these things return. So could you tell me a little bit about how Apple settled on the designs of the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros, as well as the decision to actually bring ports back for its users? Overall, designing the the new 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pro that debuted with the M1 Pro and M1 Max um, was incredibly exciting because it was the first time we had Apple Silicon uh, going into these Pro products and we knew there was these things we would be able to do and and have the vision materialize for products previously we'd only been able to imagine. And I think knowing how well the 16-inch MacBook Pro was received when it was launched, we wanted to be able to bring more screen real estate across the MacBook Pro product line and so excited to bring the 14 and 16-inch uh, t- together when we launched that product. Uh, and I think overall, I mean, you you asked specifically about the ports themselves. Of course, we always drive to have the thinnest uh, 
products that we can, just really that they are easy for you to carry around, um, right? It's all about, we want you to be able to have this mobile powerhouse with you. And certainly thin and light plays plays a part of that. And with, with Apple Silicon and this new design, we were able to bring uh, HDMI and SD uh, back. We know having a wide array of ports uh, can certainly benefit pro workflows. Uh, so we are excited about that. And then of course, bringing MagSafe back with, with more support for um, its capability for charging and fast charging. Uh, so we're excited about that. I think we all also have stories about how, how MagSafe has, has helped protect our, our Mac in various scenarios. And talking about those two sizes of 14 and 16 inches, with Apple Silicon, you're able to provide the same power regardless of which one the user chooses, which is generally not typical. Usually the smaller device you get, the less powerful it is. And that's not even taking the M2 iPad Pro into account, where you just have all this power in a super thin device. Can you give us some insight into how you're putting increasingly more powerful chips into increasingly smaller devices over time. Yeah, so I, I think part of what you're seeing is this uh, you know, now you know decade plus long uh, kind of maniacal obsession with power efficient performance and energy efficiency. If you look at the the roots of Apple Silicon, it all started with the phone and the iPad, uh, and there you know we're we're fitting into very very constrained environments, um, and so we had to build these building blocks, whether it's our CPU or GPU, media engines, neural engine. Uh, to fit in something that's way, way smaller from a thermal standpoint uh, and a power delivery standpoint than, than like a 16-inch MacBook Pro. And so I think the, the fundamental building blocks are just way more efficient than what you're typically used to seeing in, in a product like this. I think the other thing that you're, you're noticing is for a lot, of, a lot of tasks that maybe used to be high-powered use cases, on Apple Silicon, they, they actually don't consume that much power. Um, if you look at like the, you know, compared to what you might find in the, uh, in a competing PC product, depending on the workload, we might be a factor of two or a factor of four, uh, times lower power that allows us to kind of deliver a lot of these workloads that, that might've been high power use cases, uh, on a, on a different product in, in something that, that actually is, is a, uh, a very quiet and cool and, and long lasting sort of use case. The other thing that you're noticing is that single threaded performance, so the snappiness of of, uh, of your machine, it's really the same like high performance core, regardless of if you're talking about a, a MacBook Air, 14 inch Pro, 16 inch Pro, um, or, or like the new Mac Mini. And so, you know, all of these machines can accommodate one of those cores running full tilt. Again, we've, we've turned a lot of those usage uh, usages and, and use cases into low power workloads. You can't get around physics though, right? So there, you know, if you light up all the cores, all the GPUs, the 14 inch system just has less thermal capacity than the 16, right? So depending on your workload, that might drive you to a bigger machine. But they're really, uh, the, the chips are kind of across the board, um, incredibly efficient. Yeah, and when you said you can't beat physics, that's an interesting statement because it's obviously true. But at the same time, Apple Silicon has been such a revelation in the industry because while you can't beat physics, no one is coming as close to beating it as Apple has with Apple Silicon. And I think what you just said is a good point. When it comes to single core, whether you buy an M2, M2 Pro, or M2 Max, when it comes to single core performance, you get the same experience. And that's regardless of which chip you choose, which hasn't been the case in the past. So when you were choosing between a core i3, i5, i7, or i9, if you went with a core i3, you might see a delay if you have too many tabs open or just trying to launch your email app versus going with a higher end chip. Contrast that with Apple Silicon and you can get a base level M2 and start editing 8K video. But the other side of the coin that you mentioned, I did want to touch on battery efficiency. So there's all this power there. And at the same time, while these devices are thin and lightweight, you're giving us more battery life in the same size chassis with double digit performance gains on both CPU and GPU. So I think the question on a lot of people's minds is how? How is it possible to ship a Mac with the longest battery life ever while also giving double digit performance gains in the same size computer? We of course have this incredible chip and Anand will speak to, to what we did there to, to improve the efficiency and, and get more battery life. In addition to that, we're always working with a number of teams to make many optimizations to get the most out of, out of the, the hardware that we have. And so that includes working closely with Mac OS uh, and firmware you know, across the system entirely to really optimize things so we are getting the most out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at how uh, 
uh, chip design works at Apple. One, you have to remember we're not a we're not a merchant silicon vendor. At the end of the day, we ship product, and so the the story for the the chip team actually starts at the product, right? There is a vision that the the design team that the the system team has that they want to enable, and the the job of the chip is to enable those features, enable that product, and and deliver the best performance within the constraints within the thermal envelope of that chassis that's that's uh, humanly possible. And so if you look at kind of what we did going from uh, the M1 family to, to M2 Pro and M2 Max, at any given power point, we're able to deliver more, more performance. If you look at uh, on the CPU, we, we added two more efficiency cores, two more of our E cores. Uh, and that allowed us to deliver kind of, it was part of what allowed us to deliver more multi-thread performance. Again, at every single power point where the M1 and M2 curves overlap, we're able to deliver more performance at any given power point. Uh, the dynamic range of operations a little bit longer, uh, a little bit wider. So we we do have a, a a slight increase in terms of peak power, but in terms of efficiency, kind of across the range, it is a, a step forward versus uh, the M1 family, and that directly translates into battery life. Uh, the same thing is true for the GPU. It's kind of counterintuitive, but a, a big GPU running at you know a, a modest frequency and voltage uh, is actually a, a very efficient way to fill up the box. Um, and so that's been our philosophy, you know, dating back to, to phone and, and uh, for, to iPhone and iPad, uh, and it kind of continues in the Mac as well. But really, the you know the the thing that we see, the, the thing that you know the iPhone and the iPad have enjoyed over the years is this idea that you know every generation gets the latest of our IPs, you know, our latest CPU IP, latest GPU, neural engine, media engine, so on and so forth. And so now the Mac gets to be on that cadence too. And if you look at how we've evolved things on the phone and iPad those IPs tend to get more efficient over time. You know, there is this relationship. If the, if the fundamental chassis doesn't change, any additional performance you, you deliver has to be done more efficiently. And so this is the first time the, the MacBook Pro gets to really enjoy that and be on that same sort of cycle. It is incredible. And I want to bring Tuba in on this as well, because I was excited to find out that we were going to have someone from Apple's Pro Workflows team here. Now, I'm just assuming here, but it seems obvious that a lot of what we're seeing these days from Apple has been at least informed by the Pro Workflows team, which I believe was announced back in 2018. Can you give me a rundown of who this team is comprised of and what type of feedback and information Apple gathers from it? Absolutely. Um, we have some incredibly talented creatives who are area experts in audio music, video, photography, 3D visual effects um, industries. And we are paired with super smart system architects. And together we work um, on these very complex, challenging pro workflows um, and make them run awesome on the Mac. So it's a fun collaboration between like technology and art. And we kind of gather both of them, both sides together and um, make them, yeah, run perfect on the Mac. So what are some of the results of the pro workflow team? Apple put the team together in conjunction with the announcement that the 2019 Mac Pro would be coming in the future. So the team has been there for a while now. Can you talk about some of the things that consumers are directly benefiting from and using in Apple products today that maybe we might not have seen if not for the Pro Workflow team? I mean, it's a collective effort. I think we, as a Pro Workflow team, we work very closely cross-functionally across Apple, whether it's hardware or software. And um, we've been championing for these Pro features that we want on the platform and constantly push for more performance. But we also look for the future and see what's coming. And so there's always innovation in our minds and we kind of try to keep up the pace um, when it comes to innovation as well. Often we'll hear people in the media say that Apple won't make this product as powerful as this other Apple product because then it would cannibalize the sales of the more expensive products. And that kind of flies in the face to what Steve Jobs famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if anything is going to cannibalize an Apple product, it should be another Apple product. And it really feels like we're seeing that mantra kind of play out with the launch of the M2 Pro Mac Mini. For the first time, you're giving the power of the MacBook Pro to users of the Mac Mini. And the result here is you no longer need to buy the more expensive MacBook Pro if that's the level of performance you want but don't need the portability. So can you talk a little bit about that philosophy of what the M2 Pro Mac Mini in particular means to the Mac lineup? I think it was a real exciting announcement and got a very positive reception because it is something new. I think it was somewhat unexpected given we announced this amazing Mac Studio product just last year. And I think it's just exciting to have these, these options that give users that flexibility that with Mac Mini, with the M2, the M2 Pro, 
that really is a broad range of performance based on your user needs. And if you need to take it further, you have Mac Studio. And then, of course, pushing that to the extreme, you have Mac Pro. Um, so I think just, again, we, we want to just serve those customers and, and their needs and give them that choice and flexibility. So we're really excited to bring M2 Pro to Mac Mini. On the silicon side, uh, the team doesn't pull any punches, right? I think the goal across all the IPs is... Uh, one, make sure you can enable the vision of the product. So if there's a new feature, new capability that we have to bring to the table in order for uh, for the product to you know uh, have everything that we envision, that's that's clearly something that you can't pull back on. And then secondly, it's it's do the best you can, right? Get as much down in terms of performance and capability as you can every single generation. And I, I think the other thing is, you know, at the end of the day, Apple's not a chip company. Uh, at the end of the day, we're a product company. So if what we want to deliver, uh, whether it's features, performance, efficiency. If we're not able to deliver something compelling, we won't engage, right? We won't we won't build the chip. And so each generation, we're motivated as much as possible to, to deliver the best that we can. Obviously, as a tech reviewer, I have my own opinion on what I recommend people buy for their own specific needs. But from Apple's perspective, you have the range, as you mentioned, the Mac Mini, the iMac, MacBook Pro, Mac Pro. Do you have a philosophy towards how you would recommend a consumer make a choice when they're looking at the lineup and making a purchase? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, we really want to put that in the, the hands of the user uh, based on their needs. And I think, you know, our, our goal is to make sure if they're looking for that everyday product that they have options for both a, a desktop and a laptop. Uh, and if they are pushing their creativity and need more performance and, and going to that pro level, they also have amazing options for a desktop and, and a laptop. Okay, let's have some fun and move on to the explain it like I'm five years old section. I think there's some things that people understand for the most part and some things that they might not grasp that I'm hoping you guys can help clarify. So one of the things I think a lot of people don't fully grasp is the neural engine. I think they understand the CPU and the GPU on the RAM, at least for the most part, because they understand the direct benefit of each of those things. But the neural engine feels a bit more mysterious. So how would you explain what the neural engine is and how it directly benefits the customer. Yeah, so I'll take the, the first half of that, and then I think Laura can chime in with um, some of the customer benefits. Um, there are really two things you need to think about, right? The first is this trade-off between a general-purpose compute engine and something a little more specialized. So if you look at our CPU and GPU, these are big general-purpose compute engines. Uh, they, they each have their strengths in terms of the types of applications you'd want to send to the CPU versus, versus the GPU. Whereas the neural engine uh, is, is more focused in, time, in terms of the types of operations that it's optimized for. But if you have a workload that's supported by the neural engine, then you get the most efficient, highest density place on the chip to execute that workload. And so that's the first part of it. The second part of it is, well, what kind of workload that we're talking about? And, and our investment in the neural engine date, dates back years ago, right? So the first time we had a neural engine on an Apple Silicon uh, chip was uh, A11 Bionic, right? So that was uh, five-ish years ago on the iPhone. And really, it was the result of uh, us realizing that there were these emergent machine learning models where that we wanted to start executing on device. And so we, we, we brought this technology to the iPhone, and then over the years, we've been increasing its capabilities and its performance. Uh, and then we made the, the transition to the Mac to Apple Silicon. It got that IP just like it got the, the other IPs that we brought, uh, like things like the Media Engine, our CPU, GPU, Secure Enclave, so on and so forth. So when you're going to execute these machine learning models, um, performing in, inference on these, uh, these inference-driven models, if the operations that you're executing are supported by the neural engine, if they're you know if they're uh, uh, fit nicely on that engine, like I said, it's the most efficient way to execute them. Now the reality is the entire chip is optimized for machine learning, right? So a lot of models you will see execute on the CPU, the GPU, and the neural engine, and we have frameworks in place that that kind of make that possible. Um, but the goal is to always execute it at the most uh, in the highest performance, most efficient place possible on the chip. And I would just add that the the end benefit of that is just more performance and your system is doing more for you and you're not even aware of it. One great example would be things we do with our image signal processor, that it is taking information from, from that image coming in and uh, adjusting your image and optimizing your image. Uh, so there's benefits across the board and I think the magic is you don't even know it's happening. It's all, it's all done for you uh, and highly optimized. Okay, next, the nanometer process. I think this is another one that the average person doesn't quite fully grasp when they see it mentioned in a keynote. 
So how would you explain what this is and the importance of decreasing that nanometer process size? Yeah, so here I think you're referring to the transistor. Uh, these are the building blocks uh, uh, by which all of our chips are, are built out of. Uh, and the, the simplest way to think of them is a, like a little switch. Uh, and we integrate tons of these things into our design. So if you look at M2 Pro and M2 Max, you're, you're talking about tens of billions of these. And if you think about large collections of them, that's how we build the CPU, the GPU, the neural engine, all the media blocks. Every part of the chip is built out of these transistors. Moving to a new transistor technology is one of the ways in which we deliver more features, more performance, more efficiency, better battery life. Uh, so you can imagine if the transistors get smaller, you can cram more of them into a given area. That's how you might add things like additional cores, which is something you get in, in M2 Pro and M2 Max. You get more CPU cores, more GPU cores, so on and so forth. Uh, if the transistors themselves use less power or they're faster, that's another method in which you might deliver uh, better performance, better battery life, better efficiency. Now, I mentioned this is one tool in the toolbox. What you choose to build with them, you know, the underlying architecture, microarchitecture, and design of the chip also contribute in, in terms of delivering that performance, those features, and that, that power efficiency. Okay, and as we've seen in the past, you can still improve a chip and make it better even without decreasing the transistor size. Yeah, so if you, you, know, if you look at the, the M2 Pro and M2 Max mm -hmm. family, uh, you know, we talk about them being on a, on a second generation five nanometer process. Uh, and as, as we you know, talked about earlier, right, the chip got more efficient mm -hmm. at every single operating point. The chip is able to deliver more performance at the same amount of power. All right, and next, the media engine. When you look at the afterburner card in the Mac Pro and then compare it to the size of the media engine on the M2 package, it's just hard for me to wrap my head around these performance gains. How did you take something that was so large and then fit it onto something so tiny and give it more performance? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, going back to the, the point around transistors, I think taking that, that, that IP and integrating it on, you know, the latest kind of highly integrated SOC with the latest transistor technology that lets you, you know, run it at a very high speed and you get to extract a lot of performance out of it. And I think the other thing is, you know, and this is one of the things that's fairly unique about Apple Silicon, uh, we build these highly integrated SOCs. Right? So if you think about you know, the, the traditional system architecture in a, uh, in a desktop or a notebook, you, know, you might have a, a, a CPU from one vendor, a, a GPU from another vendor, each with their own sort of DRAM. You might have uh, accelerators kind of built into each one of those chips. You might have add-in cards as, uh, as additional accelerators. Uh, but with Apple Silicon in, in, in the Mac, it's, it's all a single chip, all backed by a, like a unified memory system. You get a tremendous amount of memory bandwidth as well as you know, DRAM capacity, which is unusual right, in a machine like this. Normally, you know, a, a CPU is used to having uh, a very large capacity, low bandwidth DRAM, and a GPU might have very low capacity, high bandwidth DRAM. But now the CPU gets access to, to GPU-like memory bandwidth, the GPU gets access to CPU-like capacity, uh, and that really enables things that you couldn't have done before. Really, if you're, you're trying to build a, a notebook, these are the types of chips that you want to build it out of. And the media engine comes along for the ride, right? This is technology that you know, we, we refined over the years building for iPhone and iPad. And these are machines that, you know, they, they, the camera is a key part of that experience. And being able to bring some of that technology to the Mac uh, was honestly pretty exciting. And it, it really enabled uh, uh, just a revolution in terms of the video editing and video workflows. How has the media engine kind of evolved over time? And, you know, I think one of the things that uh, was pretty exciting, and, and it goes back to your question around how do we work with teams like the Pro Workflows team? I think the addition of ProRes as uh, a hardware accelerated encode and decode engine as a part of the media engine, that's one of the things that you can almost trace back directly to working with the Pro Workflows team, right? This is a codec that it makes sense to accelerate, to integrate into hardware. It's important for uh, both our customers, um, you know, the people that were expecting to buy these machines. Uh, and it was something that, you know, the team was able to integrate. I think for those workflows, there's nothing like it. Uh, in the industry on the market. I feel pretty certain that you've heard some interesting stories of how people push their Macs to the limit. So I'm curious if you could share any story about people using their Mac in a way that impressed or even shocked you. I'll, I'll start that off with some some more general answers to that. Ed, uh, Nan, and, and Tuba may have some specific fun examples, but we've been developing Max for our pro community for a long, very long time. And we're so inspired by what they do. And that really is what drives us to constantly be pushing, pushing the capabilities forward. And so when we talked about these, these latest MacBook Pros with Apple Silicon, we talk about how it's just been a complete game changer 
And we don't just say that. We're, we're hearing these examples of these amazing scenarios of what it truly has enabled for creative pros, whether that's a photographer who needs to, you know, wants to go out into the wilderness to take photos and used to, you know, have to lug and carry all this equipment who now, because the performance and the amazing battery life is fine to go out, you know, on, on that expedition, uh, carrying his latest, uh, MacBook Pro to folks creating musical scores that can just tax the system in incredible ways, but they're able to do that all on, the, all on their notebook and you know not have to be back at the studio. And they can be cross continent working with with the studio uh, and able to piece that all together. And so these ideas that you don't have to be in the edit bay. Uh, in the studio that you can be remote and not only be remote, but you can get that same performance that you would have whether you're plugged in or on battery. And that's that's been huge uh, for our pros as well. Um, yeah, just to follow Laura's um, comment, like we've seen singer songwriters recording songs on their MacBook Pro with the built-in microphone because they don't have the fan noise interfering anymore. And they can just take that workflow wherever they want wherever that creative idea comes in and they can just create, which is which is really delightful to see. And also, personally, I'm a very outdoorsy person. I go camping all the time. And every time I see a camper van parked and you see someone with a camping chair with a MacBook Pro just doing their work on the side of the road, you know, it's just so great to see that. It feels like we're enabling more people to do their work wherever they want to be. And yeah, it's really great to be part of that transition. You know, I, I remember prior to the launch of M1, there was a part of me that was like, oh, you know, I, I don't know if people are going to get this until we launch, you know, M1 Max and M1 Ultra and and almost feeling like uh, M1's nice, but it's the small chip, right? Mm -hmm. Like nah, how excited are people going to be about it? And we knew how fast it was going to be on paper, but there is a difference, right? When you go and actually like use one of these machines. Uh, I remember I, I you know, uh, moved my, my personal machine at the time to a, an M1 Mac Mini. I, and it just, it feels like alien technology, right? Like it feels so fast. At that time, it was like the fastest desktop I, I had access to, right? Like it, 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 was, uh, it was a game changer. And then to be able to have that same sort of snappiness and responsiveness and all of that in a notebook with like a battery that just felt like it lasted forever, uh, that, that to me was, uh, even as someone who, who knew what to expect, it still felt unexpected. When we first started using an M1, and the MacBook Air, you know, we're, we're testing everything, we're using it as much as we possibly can, and we just noticed that the battery indicator wasn't moving. And we all thought, there, there's got to be something amiss here, like what's happening? And so I think to Adon's point, that's really interesting how on paper, we knew it was supposed to deliver these things and the promise of it, but to actually experience it, what well, started to get pretty, pretty magical. Now, I'm on the other side as someone who takes in the Apple events and then test the products afterwards. And I remember a lot of us, when the initial M1 was announced, were like, there's no way, like, what are they talking about? There's no way. And then we get them in and it's exactly how it was presented. And so many people were blown away. It felt like alien technology. And I'm actually currently using the M2 Max 16 inch MacBook Pro. And I was on a cross country flight last week. And for the first two hours I was doing video editing. And then I started getting worried because I was thinking to myself, I know they said 22 hours of battery life, but that's video playback and I'm doing video editing. How long is my battery gonna last? And so I glanced up at my battery after two hours of editing and I had 92% battery life left. Like I'm video editing. So for me, it's still mind blowing and I can't wait to see what you guys have up your sleeve next. Yeah, M2 Pro and M2 Max, they're, they're really just better versions of, of what we've we've shipped before, right? Like it's it's that same great formula, that same power efficient performance, and you just get more. Yeah, and I think that's the key thing, like with M1 MacBook Pro in 2021, like that laptop was incredible. Like performance was awesome, the power efficiency, and then it came with an HDR display, mm -hmm. which is huge for the Pro community. And then with M2, now we have 96 gigs of memory. So if you're a Pro that needs that little bit extra, you got it. And, you know, we'll keep innovating. So um, it's just very exciting to be part of this journey. I like how you called 96 gigs a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Okay, I think that's time. So Laura, Adnan, Tuba, thank you so much for taking the time and joining me today to talk about the Mac and Apple Silicon. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys found that as interesting as I did. I've actually been a fan of Anon since I started reading Anon Tech way back in 2004. As before joining Apple, he ran a PC hardware review website. 
As you probably know, Apple hasn't generally been known to do these kinds of on the record interviews that often. So it was definitely an exciting privilege to get this opportunity. What's going on everybody? Andrew Edwards here coming to you from WWDC 2023. I just finished taking a look at Apple's brand new Vision Pro AR headset. I've got some thoughts. I've got some observations that I wanted to share, starting with the home screen. So the first time you put the headset on, you hit the digital crown, you press it down and you go through an eye measurement. This is how the sensors are gonna determine where your eyes look, specifically when you're looking at points of interest inside your field of view. After that's done, another press will bring up the home screen, which is your view of the different apps that you can use. And this is where you see the eye tracking start to work, because as you look at the different app icons, you'll see them kind of jump forward, depending on which one you look at, almost similar to scrolling through the app icons in tvOS. And anything you're looking at that you want to select, you just pinch your thumb and forefinger together, boom, look at something, boom, selected. You want to drag something, you just pinch and then just move it around in, in space. You can push it backwards, you can make it bigger, all just with a simple two finger gesture. The first app that I jumped into was the Photos app. So you go into the app and then when you select the photo, it'll actually come to the forefront and dim the room behind you. So it's almost like someone lowered the lights in the room so you could really focus on the images and you can start to swipe through them, take a look at them, make them bigger. And then if you go into a panoramic photo and make it full size, it'll actually surround the entire view that you have. So it'll give you a 180 degree view of this image. And you can actually like stand up and like peer over and see into the photo and reveal things that you can't see when you're standing back, which is very interesting. So all those panorama photos that you've ever taken that you can't really see on your phone because the screen is so small or even on your Mac because it's so thin, this makes it perfect to view. It almost puts you back in the scene where you took that picture. Then there is spatial photos. And these are a big part of of the Vision Pro headset, so much so that there's a dedicated button on the device for taking photos and videos. And there's only two buttons on it. So you've got the digital crown button, which takes you to the home screen, then the other button that captures photos and videos. And so the first thing was a 3D photo of a birthday scene. And when you pull this up, you actually feel like there's a some sort of modeled um, clay figures of people right in front of you. It feels like you can just reach out and interact with them. And then when you move over to the video portion, it puts you right in the scene so it seems like you can speak to these people that you because you can hear them they should be able to hear you obviously they can't but it's kind of uncanny and maybe even a little dystopian to some people the way that you can capture a moment that makes it seem like you are back literally back there standing in that same moment that you captured pre. Then I went on to multitasking. So I had my photos app open um, and I opened up messages. And again, same thing. The only thing you need to use to open up these apps is to look at an app icon and pinch with your two fingers. So I opened up messages. I moved photos away from the center of my view. I grabbed it and put it basically on the ceiling made it a little bigger, brought messages into my right-hand side and then Safari to my left. And even though photos were in the background, I could still, if I looked at anything that was selectable, I can still select it and interact with photos without bringing it to the forefront of my view like you might have to do on something like a Mac or even on the iPhone. And remember this device has an M2 chip in it, the same chip you'd find in the currently shipping MacBook Air. So you've got a lot of power. It has the power of a computer on your face. And so running all these apps simultaneously was no big deal. Then I went into the environment. So you go into the environments area and there's a whole bunch of different options you can select. I chose Mount Hood. And as soon as I did that, what, what is Mount Hood? We're in the hood. <laughs> we're in the hood, big dog. Uh, we were in Mount Hood. Mount Hood. So yeah, so I chose Mount Hood and instantly the room I was in disappeared. And instead I saw a mountain in the background, a lake in front of me, some sort of, I don't remember, I think there was some grass or something, but basically it was a night sky and I was transported into Mount Hood. Now I could use a digital crown on the, my top right to fully immerse myself and basically choose how immersive I wanted it to be. Did I just want it to be 180 degrees so I can turn to my side and still see the room I was in or did I want it to just completely enclose me so that no matter where I looked, I was inside of that environment. This is where I also experienced breakthrough. Breakthrough is when you're in an environment and someone in the room, same room as you, comes to speak to you or talk to you. So the cameras inside of the Vision Pro recognized I was looking at a person and that person kind of slowly faded in to my view so I can actually see them and have a conversation with them. I can see them, I can hear them, they can hear me obviously, we can have a conversation and then I can turn 
away from them and they would slowly fade away and I'd be back in this uh, Mount Hood environment. Then it was time for mindfulness and meditation. So I went into the mindfulness app. This was kind of strange. So I was sitting there on the couch and a, a ball that seemed to be made of digital leaves was floating in front of me, an orb was floating in front of me. And I heard a, a voice kind of walking me through a meditation and all of a sudden the orb starts contracting and expanding like it was breathing. And then on one last breath, it kind of opened up and then the room went dark and I was just flooded with these multicolored neon leaves coming at me as I was breathing, as I was meditating. That sounds kind of intense, but it wasn't intense. It was, it was, actually, it was actually very calming. It, it did its job. But yeah, one minute mindfulness break before we went into the next demo, FaceTime. And this one was kind of strange to me. Now, keep in mind, we're currently in June, 2023 and Apple said, the Vision Pro is not gonna ship until early 2024. So I'm guessing that's about eight or nine months from now. So there's still time to work out things that don't feel quite right. The Vision Pro can map your face and create a persona, a digital persona of you. And then it'll use the sensors built in to kind of see how your mouth is moving and how your eyes are moving to make your persona look like you when you're in a FaceTime call while using the headset. The thing is, you can kind of tell that the eyes move and the mouth moves, but the the rest of the face doesn't really have the same natural human movement. So you're in the kind of uncanny valley area when on a FaceTime call with someone who's using the headset. The facial expressions need to be improved. I actually thought we were gonna be using Memojis for FaceTime calls. Then you kind of get rid of that effect as well and maybe a little more fun, but I get what they're going for, some realism. It's just not enough realism. So it's kind of strange, but besides that, yeah, spatial audio built in. So I was actually doing a FaceTime call with someone right in front of me. And I dragged them off to the side because we were gonna do some collaborating in the free format. So I dragged them off to the side so I can hear them in the room on my left, upper left, as we were collaborating on this free form board. It was a 3D board of a home and you can actually get up and look inside, almost like you're looking in a dollhouse and see all the different pieces on this board. It was very cool. Then we jumped into the entertainment portion of the demo. This was one of my favorites. So the first thing I did was I went into the Apple TV Plus app and I pulled up Avatar in 3D and I created essentially about an 80 or 90 inch TV display right in front of me. I was watching Avatar in 3D in 4K with HDR. It looked fantastic and it sounded amazing. Um, the headphones I was using, by the way, actually I wasn't using any headphones, I was using the built-in audio from the headset and it sounded, it was 3D audio, fantastic. I didn't need to put on AirPods or anything to do this. Avatar looked great in 3D, the HDR looked amazing. And then we went from the living room environment into the movie theater cinema environment. So all of a sudden I had a 100 foot display in front of me where I could watch Avatar again in 3D, it was super cool. From there I took a look at Apple's immersive video format. It's a new format where they record 180 degree video in 3D and it puts you right in the action. So I had Alicia Keys. I was in a hotel room where Alicia Keys was doing a jam session with her musicians, her band, and she was just singing. I was just there in the room with them. I'm listening to the jam session. Then I was on the top of a mountain while someone was trying to go across a tightrope, which was thrilling. Then I was in a, a herd, a collection of baby rhinos. I was just in there with them, baby rhinos coming to check, check me out. Then all of a sudden I'm underwater with a bunch of sharks around. So it was just a demo kind of, kind of showing how you can use immersive video in 3D to truly immerse you. Because again, Avatar was just a video screen in front of me. And then these were videos that I was actually feeling like I was inside of. Then there was the grand finale. So they said there was one more experience. I'm gonna sit back, relax. Again, there is a depth camera. So the Vision Pro headset knows the size of the room that you're in, how far things are from each other, using LiDAR, using the depth sensor. So the rear wall in the room all of a sudden started opening up and then expanding into a portal. And the portal was to a prehistoric world. A butterfly flew into the room um, from that portal. They told me, put your hand out, put your finger out, see if it lands on there. It did, it flew over, it found my hand, landed on my finger. As I moved my hand around, it stayed on my finger um, before flying off a few seconds later. Then inside that world, I saw a little tiny, a baby dinosaur kind of walking around for a few seconds before something scared it. And then you hear these footsteps coming from behind you and then around, then you see a, a T-Rex come into the frame inside the room or inside that portal. Then it looks at you and it pokes its head into the room and then walks in. So now you've got the portal behind you, T-Rex in the room with you and you can get up, 
because again, it's AR, you can see the room that you're in. You can get up and walk right up to it and that's where you determine that there is no screen door effect with the Reality Pro headset. That's something that's been a big complaint from people using VR headsets for many years. The screen door effect is still a thing that kind of takes you out of the realism. But with this, that wasn't there. You've got the micro LED displays that are such high resolution and those pixels are so small, you can't see them with the naked eye. So when you walk up to the dinosaur, you can basically see the scales on its skin. It also knows that you've walked up to it, so it starts like looking at you and like smelling your hand if you put your hand out. After, I don't know, 10 or 20 seconds, it decided to turn around and go back into the portal. And then the tail just like swings around and you feel like you need to duck out of the way because you don't want to get hit. Obviously, you're not going to. There's no dinosaur there, but you feel it because everything feels so real. It walked away, the portal closed, and that was the end of my demo. Using Apple's Vision Pro headset was, in my opinion, a game changing or maybe even life changing experience. It really feels like getting a glimpse of the future, not just the future of technology, but the future as a whole, the future of living. As Apple said, Vision Pro is going to cost $3,500, $3,499, and it will be launching in early 2024. Obviously very expensive, but once you use it, you understand why it costs so much and where the value lies. One thing I should probably mention, I've been seeing a lot in the comments and discussion online, a lot of people are saying, hey, so expensive, I'm probably just gonna stick with the Oculus. That'll be my option, which is totally fine. Obviously, not everyone can afford $3,500 for an entertainment device, but there are some key differences that I think a lot of people aren't understanding. First of which is the Oculus is a VR headset, virtual reality, while Apple's is an augmented reality headset. It takes all the measurements for itself. You don't have to tell it uh, where you are, where your furniture is. It doesn't block you off from the world. So there's, there's a difference, not just in price, but in functionality and usage. The other thing, anytime I use an Oculus headset, a lot of things feel like cartoonish. If that dinosaur walked into the room on my Oculus headset, on the MetaQuest 2, for example, it would have been a very cartoony, um, wacky looking dinosaur, while this one that the Reality Pro headset gave me looked very realistic and lifelike. So I guess the one way to sum it up is that when you use a MetaQuest headset, it's taking you in into a different world and using Apple's Vision Pro it's actually bringing new things into your world. I'm super hyped to see this thing drop. I know it's expensive. It really was a enlightening experience and I hope you get to try it out for yourself. You'll be able to do so in Apple retail stores across the US. Go check it out and see for yourself if you agree with my take. Apple has an all new 15 inch MacBook Air and I've been using this midnight colored version for about a week straight as my main laptop. There's a lot to talk about here. So let's jump right in starting with the unboxing. On the inside of the box, you'll find the MacBook Air right on top. And setting that aside, you also have the 35 watt dual USB-C charger. So you can use this to charge up the MacBook Air and it also has an extra port you can use to charge another device at the same time without having to use one of the ports on the Air itself to do so. Now inside the sleeve, we have some info on the MacBook Air along with a couple of black Apple stickers. I assume black because this is the midnight color. Then there's the MagSafe cable. These are color matched to the finish of the MacBook Air that you choose. They're MagSafe on one side and USB-C on the other. So you can use other USB-C chargers as long as they provide the appropriate amount of power. Now let's talk a bit about this design. The 13-inch M2 MacBook Air gave us the first major redesign since 2010. Yes, for 12 years, Apple had been using the now iconic tapered design that we had all become accustomed to on the MacBook Air. Well, the 15-inch model gives us a larger display on the Air for the first time in the entire history of the product. It's similar to the 13 inch model with an enclosure that sees even thickness all around, it kind of resembles a miniaturized version of the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is a very good thing in my opinion. The new Air is 11.5 millimeters thick and weighs just 3.3 pounds. And that's just about half a pound more than the 13 inch model. And like the 13 inch model, when you first pick it up, it feels kind of odd. It almost feels like an empty shell of a laptop or like a toy just due to how light it is. You get a headphone jack with support for high impedance headphones on the right and two Thunderbolt 4 ports on the left alongside a MagSafe connector for charging. Now on the previous model, you had to use one of the two Thunderbolt ports for charging. So this is a very welcome change as is the full size function key row and touch ID button on the keyboard. Of course, one of the most important parts of the MacBook Air is on the inside, 
which brings me to the Apple M2 chip. While the base M2 chip sports an eight core CPU and eight core GPU on the 13 inch Air, the 15 inch model ships with the 10 core GPU variant of the M2 only. That's with 256 gigabytes of storage, and eight gigabytes of RAM. You can upgrade the RAM to 16 or 24 gigabytes and the storage can go all the way up to two terabytes if you need the space. The new M2 chip offers about one and a half times the performance of the M1 model depending on the task. The model I've been testing here from Apple has one terabyte of storage and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Up next, Let's talk about the display. This is the biggest change to the MacBook Air. The previous 13.6 inch display has been significantly enlarged, bringing the diagonal screen size to 15.3 inches. This gives you a lot more room to work with, especially with the menu bar brought up and out of the way. And you'll also find a 1080p camera inside of the display cutout at the top, similar to the MacBook Pro. The display is also 20% brighter, hitting 500 nits of brightness, and it can actually go down to two nits of brightness if you wanna dim it. And it also supports P3 wide color, giving it the ability to display a billion colors. Oh, and when watching videos, you'll experience the new six speaker array, which are compatible with spatial audio and Dolby Atmos. Now it's not as good as what you'd find in a dedicated Atmos setup, or even on Apple's more expensive computers, but the sound here is very good and is a marked improvement over both the M1 and Intel-based Airs. The 15-inch model here gets two sets of force-canceling woofers, resulting in twice the bass depth of even the M2 13-inch Air, resulting in fuller sound. It's basically the best sounding MacBook Air Apple's ever made. Now, in my opinion, no matter how cool a laptop is supposed to be, I need the display, keyboard, and trackpad to be absolutely on point. And for the MacBook Air, I'm happy to say that it meets those basic requirements. The full height function row with Touch ID here makes the typing experience feel premium. Okay, so what about actually using the M2 MacBook Air. The M2 chip provides 38% faster video editing performance and 20% faster image filters and effects performance when compared to M1, which just sounds nuts for a machine so thin, but that's the same thought I had about the 13 inch model as well. Now I know this isn't what everyone does on their machines and it's certainly not what most people buy a MacBook Air to do, but video editing is taxing and is something I'm very comfortable doing. So it would give me a good sense of any hiccups in performance. Opening projects and editing on the air felt easy and content played back like butter. Super smooth when both playing and when scrubbing through the timeline. I was impressed. Now impressed enough to replace my 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M2 Air? No, but still I am impressed that Apple's entry level M2 is this freaking good. Up next, let's talk about the colors. They're silver, which is the most classic of the MacBook Air colors. Space Gray is still here for those wanting something subtly darker, but not too dark. Apple Starlight color that we've seen on some other devices. And lastly, Midnight, giving you a much more bold, dark color for those who like that look. I am obviously a huge fan of the Midnight color, as that's what I have here in both sizes of the MacBook Air. Many will point out that it shows fingerprints a lot more than the other colors, which is true, but it's also easy to wipe down and get rid of them. But I think it's the most unique color for any Apple computer, and I'm a fan of it. Now let's talk battery life. According to Apple, the 15 inch MacBook Air gets up to 18 hours of battery life, which is actually similar to the 13 inch model despite having a larger size. I assume that means a larger battery, but you also have a larger display. It should also be said that 18 hours is based on watching videos with all radios turned off. And I personally don't know anyone who actively shuts down Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when watching videos, especially since most people are streaming them. Now in my tests, just using the MacBook Air for typical tasks, my day-to-day -day stuff, email, web browsing, messaging, Discord, Slack, RSS reader, calendar, those types of things, I saw just over 14 hours of battery life, give or take. That is still great and definitely feels like all day battery life to me. Basically, if I had to go into an office, I could take my fully charged MacBook Air with me and I won't even need to plug in during the typical eight hour work day. And seriously, for a computer this thin to have that much battery life, once again, it's just a testament to Apple Silicon and what they've been able to do here. Picture this, 
you're a painter standing in front of a blank canvas. You have an idea in your head of what you want to create, but you're not sure how to get there. You start with a few brush strokes, but it's not quite right. You try again and again, and then finally it clicks. The colors blend together perfectly. The composition is just right. You've created something beautiful. Now, just like that painter, when it comes to creative work, you'll have a vision in your head of what you wanna create. And just like that painter, you need the right tools to bring that vision to life. That's where the Mac Studio comes in. It's a powerhouse system that delivers unprecedented performance and capabilities, enabling you to completely reimagine your workflows and push your creativity even further than before. This is the new Mac Studio with M2 Max chip, and I've been using it for a few weeks now. This is for creators who demand the very best. With the M2 Max chip, it's up to 50% faster than the previous generation Mac Studio and four times faster than the most powerful Intel-based 27-inch iMac. It's also a powerhouse system for video studios. Editors working on multicam projects can play more streams of 8K ProRes video than ever before, and colorists can add more corrections to their projects while maintaining fluid playback and encoding video for final delivery is faster than ever. In this video, we'll take a closer look at some of the amazing features that make the Mac Studio such an incredible device. I'll leave a link down in the description if you want to pick up the Mac Studio for yourself. Let's get started with this design. This Mac has a compact footprint that takes up minimal space on your desk, making it perfect for small workspaces. It measures just 7.7 .7 inches square and has a height of just 3.7 inches, so it fits perfectly under just about every display. The enclosure is made from a single aluminum extrusion, which gives it a premium look and feel. And with ports on both the front and back of the computer, you'll have easy access for all of your devices. Now on the outside, the Mac Studio is obviously very minimal, but things get a lot more flashy on the inside. Every element was designed to produce an unprecedented amount of performance in such a small form factor. An innovative thermal system brings air through the entire circumference of the perforated aluminum base. Air moves over a circular power supply through channels precisely placed inside the system and is propelled through the low impedance rear exhaust. This enables unconstrained performance for the M2 Max and M2 Ultra chips that the Mac Studio supports. And it operates quietly. I almost wanna say silently. For most workloads, you'll never hear it. Next, let's talk about the M2 Max chip. This is the chip that's powering the review unit Apple sent over, specifically with the 38 core GPU, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and two terabytes of storage. This chip is built using an industry leading second generation five nanometer process. And it's the same chip I've been using for about half a year in the 16 inch MacBook Pro. The M2 Max chip has more CPU and GPU cores than its predecessor, as well as more on packaged unified memory options and dramatically more memory bandwidth. Built with an astonishing 67 billion transistors, the M2 Max doubles the unified memory system of the M2 Pro to deliver 400 gigabyte per second of memory bandwidth and supports up to 96 gigabytes of memory. Its 12 core CPU delivers up to 20% faster performance versus the M1 Max, while its up to 38 core GPU is up to 30% faster than the M1 Max. And with four times the memory bandwidth of M2, you'll be able to handle even the most demanding applications with ease. These powerful chips share the same industry leading media engine that we saw in the M2 that accelerates video processing using very little power. You can also get the Mac Studio with an M2 Ultra chip, which I have not tried, which is even more powerful than the M2 Max. The M2 Ultra is built using Apple's Ultra Fusion packaging architecture, which basically connects two M2 Maxes together with an embedded silicon interposer, doubling the performance of the already incredibly powerful M2 Max chip, which is, in a word, insane. Next, let's talk about connectivity. The Mac Studio offers a wide array of ports to provide connectivity to displays and devices that are essential to a studio workflow. It has two USB-C or Thunderbolt 4 ports on the front, depending on which chip you get. M2 Max gets a USB-C, 
M2 Ultra gets Thunderbolt 4, providing easy access and up to 15 watts of power for charging devices. These ports support 10 gigabit per second USB 3 as well. The computer also has four Thunderbolt 4 ports on the back that support displays up to 6K resolution and fast data transfer at up to 40 gigabytes per second of throughput, as well as USB and DisplayPort video out and up to 15 watts of power output. The Mac Studio also has an SDXC slot up front that supports the SD 4.0 standard and the latest UHS-1 and UHS-2 SDXC card. This is ideal for photographers and videographers and is something I use several times per week. Built-in Wi-Fi 6E enables users to download up to 2.4 gigabits per second, twice as fast as the previous generation, and Bluetooth 5.3 provides connectivity to the latest Bluetooth accessories, such as low latency headphones. The enhanced HDMI port supports up to 8K 60 Hertz output, allowing up to four Pro Display XDR displays and an 8K TV at the same time. The Mac Studio also has two USB-A ports that provide five gigabit per second USB connectivity for any older USB devices you already have. Finally, there is a headphone jack that supports both high impedance headphones and also functions as a line in port. So what do all these features mean when combined? You get amazing performance with an incredible amount of connectivity options. The Mac Studio with M2 Max is incredibly speedy, especially in multi-threaded workflows. It's more than fast enough for your average owner. I found that the M2 Max is about 18% faster than the M1 Max it replaces in multi-core testing. When gaming, which is slowly but surely becoming more of a thing on Mac OS, I was seeing frame rates of about 165 frames per second in Rise of the Tomb Raider on high settings and a study 120 frames per second in Resident Evil Village on maximum setting. Like that painter who has a vision in their head of what they wanna create, we all need the right tool for the job. With the M2 Max Mac Studio, Apple has created a tool that will fit right into just about any creative workflow you can think of. And the coolest part of all that power that it has is that once you start using it, it just gets out of the way and lets you get to work. This is an impressive powerhouse of a system that delivers great performance, enabling you to completely reimagine your workflow and push your creativity further than ever before. We all know the feeling. You have a piece of tech that you love using, maybe it's an iPhone. You use it all the time and love the device. Then Apple releases a new iPhone model and suddenly your current phone seems outdated. All those upgraded camera lenses, faster processing speeds, and sleek new designs make your current device feel ancient. Well, that new phone feel is coming to your AirPods Pro 2, courtesy of iOS 17. And the best part is that there are six new features you're getting. And a couple of these upgrades are gonna make your AirPods Pro feel brand new. Apple is taking AirPods Pro 2 to the next level with intelligent audio, instant controls, and faster connectivity. Let's go over everything, starting with adaptive audio. This new capability continuously optimizes noise cancellation in your AirPods Pro 2 based on your surroundings and motion. So one second, it's blocking appliance hums, and the next, it's piping in critical traffic sounds. Adaptive audio takes transparency modes to the next level by actively tuning it to the environment you're in in real time, so you no longer need to switch between active noise cancellation and transparency modes manually. Next, conversation awareness. Now, this feature to me is a big deal. It'll automatically detect when someone starts talking to you and will instantly lower the playback volume of what you're listening to and boost their voice while lowering background noise so you can hear them clearly. No more awkward, what did you say, moments. Conversation awareness ensures you'll never miss an important conversation again. And it also helps when you're on a phone call as well, reducing the background noise around you while you speak. Honestly, I wish every pair of headphones had this. Okay, the next new feature coming to AirPods Pro 2 with iOS 17 is personalized volume. This uses on-device intelligence to gradually learn and apply your optimal loudness settings based on your individual listening habits alongside the environmental conditions that you happen to be in. So in other words, maybe you like the volume to be a certain way when you're sitting in quiet and a totally different way when you're riding the subway. This is like having a personal sound engineer 
continually tuning your music to perfection for you. The ability to set it and forget it with personalized volume is pretty clutch. Next, let's talk about mute controls. And this may be hard to believe or something you just might not have noticed, but up until this point, AirPods Pro doesn't have an onboard way to mute. In other words, if you're using the AirPods and you wanna mute yourself, you need to mute from your iPhone or iPad or whatever connected device you're using. iOS 17 fixes this and AirPods Pro will finally let you mute them from the AirPods themselves by squeezing the stem during a call. It's a small change, but the ability to instantly mute call audio right when you need to just takes the AirPods Pro to another level. Now, next is a feature that the AirPods have had for years, but the problem is this feature didn't really work all that great for a lot of people. I'm talking about auto device switching. In iOS 17, switching between your devices with your AirPods Pro 2 is getting insanely faster. It's the seamless, speedy auto device switching experience we should have had when the feature was first introduced. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, what I mean is if you're using your AirPods with your iPhone and then switch to using your Mac, your AirPods will automatically switch over to your Mac's audio. Then you leave your Mac and you pull up a YouTube video on your iPad, the AirPods just seamlessly switch over to your iPad. While using it in the iOS 17 beta, I'm getting near instantaneous audio transitions between my iPhone, iPad, and Macs with zero lag or cutout. So instead of calling this a new feature, let's just call it this feature has finally been fixed. Then there's Siri. For all of Siri's shortcomings, I love it for smart home control and I also use it when I have my AirPods in and I'm walking down the street. Siri sees two upgrades as it pertains to AirPods Pro 2 in iOS 17. First, you'll no longer have to say the hey before saying Siri. Instead, you can just say Siri to activate it. Secondly, you can now chain multiple requests together without repeating Siri each time. So you can say something like, Siri, turn up the volume and play my running playlist, and that'll execute both commands rapid fire back to back instead of you having to do it one at a time. With several game-changing intelligent audio features, instant mute controls, lightning fast switching, and an upgraded voice assistant, iOS 17 delivers big upgrades for AirPods Pro 2, making them much better wireless earbuds than they already were. What's going on everybody? Coming to you from Apple Park where Apple just introduced the new iPhone 15 Pro among other devices. But in this video, we're gonna be covering the new action button. Brand new feature, the mute switch is gone on the Pro line and it's being replaced with a button that is extremely customizable to pretty much whatever you can think of. So let's just run down the list of the options of what you can make the action button do for you. Starting with silent. So silent is basically your mute switch. You can keep the action button as your mute switch. And the way the action button works for all of these is a press and hold. So you press and hold the action button and you will put your phone into silent mode and then press and hold it again to take it out of silent mode. The other functionality the action button has is when you just press it. So instead of a press and hold, you just press it once. That just shows you the state of what the action button is in. So for example, if you have it set to your silent switch, just will show you in the dynamic island if the phone is muted or if your ringer is on. So that's the first one, that's the most basic one, but you have a ton of other options. The next one is focus mode. So you can choose to have the action button enable and turn on any focus mode that you've set up on your phone. Same thing, press and hold and your focus mode is enabled. Press once without holding and it'll just show you if you're in a focus mode or not press and hold again to turn it off. So for example, if I have a focus mode for when I'm shooting a video, I can just press and hold that button and any actions that I need my phone to take will happen just like that with that one button press. The next one is camera and I assume this will probably be the most popular thing to use the action button for. Basically press and hold from at any point to open up your camera on your iPhone. But it goes further than that because you actually have options to choose what camera mode you want to open with the action button. The options are regular photo, selfie, video, portrait, or portrait selfie. When using the action button to open the camera, once you're in the camera app, you can then use the action button as your camera shutter. And to be clear, that only works when you use the action button to open a camera, because when you're in your camera app and you have the action button set to something else, it won't work as a shutter because then it'll just show you the state of whatever you've programmed it to do. Okay, next, this is a more simple one, basic one. You do have a flashlight button on the lock screen, so it's very easy to get to your flashlight, but if you don't like that, 
you just want a one button press to turn on your flashlight, you can do that as well. Action button can be set to turn on your flashlight. Next is voice memos. At any moment when you have a thought or you're in class and you wanna record the professor or a meeting, whatever it might be, press and hold the action button to start voice memos right away. Your favorite place might be in the shower. Remember these phones are IP68 water and dust resistant, which means you bring it into the shower, you have a shower thought, it's a great idea, squeeze that action button, start talking. Next is magnifier. You can use your iPhone, if you didn't know, as a magnifying glass, basically pointing it at text or any content that you can't really see that well and looking through your viewfinder to see it better and enlarged. You can do that with the action button. Just press and hold, bring up the magnifier, and then when you're done, press and hold, turn it off. Next is shortcuts. Now this is where you unlock the power of the action button because a lot of people are gonna say, why can't I just use it to open my favorite app, for example? I'm gonna hear that a lot. Why can't I just use it to open Instagram? Why can't I just use it to open Snapchat? You can through shortcuts. Any shortcut you set up in your phone, any shortcut in your shortcuts library can be mapped to the action button. So if you have a shortcut that says open Instagram, that's it, press and hold, Instagram's open. But shortcuts are way more powerful than just opening up an app. So you might have a shortcut that says lock your door, turn off your lights, set the thermostat to a certain temperature, close the garage door if it's open, and you can just press one button on your phone, press the action button, and have that whole routine kick off with just that one button press. So shortcuts are gonna be tremendously powerful for the action button, if you choose to actually dig into them and use them. Next is accessibility. The iPhone has an insane amount of accessibility features, and if you're someone who either just likes using these features for convenience or needs to use these features in order to properly and easily use your phone, you can choose an accessibility feature and map it to the action button so it's just one tap away and not buried down in the accessibility settings. Next is Translate. Now this one is not gonna be available at launch, it's coming a little bit later, but soon you'll be able to open the Translate app using the action button, which will be cool if you just talk to people in different languages all the time, or if you're traveling somewhere to where they don't speak the same language that you speak, you can change your action button from whatever you usually use and switch it to Translate so that you always have your Translate app one click away. Next is no action at all. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no, no! So if you want to, you can use the action button in a way that allows you to not use it. Just leave it and not have any function at all if you want to. It's an option, I don't know why, but I'm sure some people are gonna say to themselves, you know what, this button isn't for me. I bought the phone, the button's not for me. I don't want it to do anything. You have that right, you have that privilege built into the options. If that's you, by the way, just comment down below on them. I need to know who's out there saying to themselves, new action button, I want it to do nothing. Let me know. These are the new AirPods Pro 2. They have a USB-C port now, but Apple has added a couple of secret new features that make these more of an AirPods Pro 2.5 update. And one of these features is truly mind-blowing. Let's get these opened up while I tell you all about them. Inside the box, we'll find the documentation for the AirPods Pro, and the AirPods Pro themselves are right here. We'll open those in just a second. Underneath, you get the variety of ear tips. New to the second generation when it was released are the extra small size to make them compatible with even more ear shapes out there. And then one other change right here Apple now includes a braided USB-C to USB-C charging cable as opposed to the lightning to USB-C cable we've been used to. And by the way, these braided cables that Apple is including with their devices these days are really nice. Back to the AirPods Pro themselves, as you can see, they look just like any other pair of second generation AirPods Pro, with the exception of the bottom, of course, where you have the new USB-C port. And more on that, in just a moment. Now one note on these, you need to be running iOS 17 in order to pair them to your iPhone, so make sure you are updated. iOS 17 just dropped earlier today. Now let's get to the new features. First is the most obvious one. You now have a USB-C port on the charging case, and if you haven't heard, the new iPhone 15 and 15 Pro devices also have USB-C ports now. So Apple has pulled the plug, if you will, 
on the lightning port on the AirPods Pro 2 as well. So have a USB-C cable, boom, plugs right in. Now, one cool touch here, you can plug a USB-C cable into the AirPods Pro second gen with that USB-C port and plug the other end into an iPhone 15 or iPhone 15 Pro. That will allow you to charge up your AirPods Pro at up to 4.5 watts. By the way, this isn't the first time that Apple has upgraded the case on AirPods Pro with a new charging method. A few years ago, they released a new MagSafe charging case for the original AirPods Pro, and they made that case available to buy separately for people who already owned AirPods Pro at the time. Oddly, Apple is not doing that this time, or at least they haven't yet. The thing about that last update though, was the AirPods Pro earbuds themselves didn't change at all. It was just a new case that supported MagSafe charging, but that isn't the case. Case? Yeah. That isn't the case this time around. Not only is there a new USB-C charging case for the AirPods Pro second generation, but the actual earbuds themselves pick up a couple of new features as well. First, the AirPods Pro second generation buds and charging case were sweat and water resistant, but now they're also dust resistant. Officially, the case and buds are rated at IP54. So the five in that number means that everything is dust protected, but not dust tight. That would mean they were IP64. And the four in IP54 means that they're protected against splashing water. So water splashed against them from any direction won't have any harmful effects. However, you don't wanna submerge them in water. But the other new feature is the most impressive though. The new AirPods Pro second gen with USB-C charging case specifically, so not the lightning version if you already have those. This new model supports lossless audio with ultra low latency when used with Apple Vision Pro. Of course, Apple Vision Pro is Apple's upcoming AR slash VR spatial computing headset dropping early next year. I cannot wait to get my hands on it again. If you missed a video I did at WWDC, I will drop a link down below with my thoughts on my time using Vision Pro. But again, lossless audio with ultra low latency. And when I say ultra low latency, we're talking single digit latency here, which is just incredible. Now this is accomplished through a new acoustic architecture in the AirPods Pro second gen with USB-C case combined with a brand new wireless audio protocol that Apple has built. The end result is 20 bit, 48 kilohertz wireless lossless audio. The most advanced iPhones ever are here with groundbreaking new features like a titanium design, customizable action button, next level cameras, serious performance boosts and more. The iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max bring monumental changes that refine what an iPhone can do. We're talking advanced technologies pulled straight from aerospace engineering, cinema grade filmmaking tools in your pocket, and even console level graphics power on a phone. With the iPhone 15 Pros, Apple is taking smartphone tech to the next level. And I explain the top five features of the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max in this video, but let's get started with the unboxing. I've got an iPhone 15 Pro Max here sent over from Apple. This is the natural titanium color with one terabyte of storage space. These days, there isn't a lot to these unboxings. You basically open up the box, and as you can see right up front, you find the iPhone. That titanium color is looking kind of hot right here though. I wasn't sure how much I liked this color, but seeing it in person and getting it in hand at the Apple event last week, I personally think this is the one to get. Now underneath, you find the documentation along with an Apple sticker. And here is also a good reminder from Apple that the iPhone 15 doesn't have a SIM card slot, so you'll need to use eSIM to get connected to your cell carrier. Also included in the box is a very nice braided USB-C to USB-C charging cable. More on that in just a bit. Oh, and here you can see the blue titanium iPhone 15 Pro, which looks very similar to the midnight blue MacBook Air. It's a very dark blue. So dark, in fact, that it pretty much looks black unless it's getting hit by just the right light. If you're in a dim room or a dark room, this just looks like a black iPhone. Oh, and Apple did also refresh their cases. This is one of those new fine woven cases. Also dark blue. Since it's fabric, I can't really let you know how it's gonna age. I've only had it for about a week, but it is a unique kind of classy look. And speaking of design, that leads me into the first feature we need to talk about when it comes to the new iPhones, and that is this design. This year on the Pro line of iPhones, we're getting an all new titanium 
material. That's right, stainless steel has been retired and in its place is an aerospace grade titanium alloy that frames the sides of the iPhone 15 Pro devices. This creates the most durable iPhone build yet while keeping them incredibly lightweight. Seriously, these iPhones feel so much lighter in the hand, which was my main complaint about the iPhone 12, 13, and 14 Pro devices. The titanium alloy allows the border widths to be shrunk down, so we also have the thinnest bezels ever on an iPhone. And I know a lot of people are obsessed with bezels and will be happy to hear that. Apple then used those smaller bezels to shrink the dimensions of the iPhone instead of keeping them the same and making the screen marginally larger. And I think that was definitely the right move. And paired with those new contoured edges, the iPhone 15 Pros feel noticeably slimmer in the hand and much more comfortable to use. But it's not just about aesthetics. The internal redesign also utilizes 100% recycled aluminum for improved repairability. So you get a more sustainable iPhone that's easier to repair and built to last. Next, let's talk about the all new action button. I did a full video on this already because for me, this is one of the most exciting features on the iPhone in a long time. This customizable button takes the place of the traditional mute switch that's been on the iPhone since the very beginning. The thing is, most people I know just set that toggle to mute and leave it there until they upgrade their phone, making it kind of pointless to a lot of people. Why have a switch that someone uses just once for the entire life of the device? Now we have a button that allows you to customize your iPhone 15 Pro to do exactly what you want it to do. The default behavior is still to quickly silence your phone with a press and hold, but now you can swap this out for more useful function based on your needs. Other options include launching the camera app from anywhere for quicker shots, turning on the flashlight instantly from your pocket, or enabling a preset focus mode like work or reading with a press. For users with accessibility needs, the action button is a game changer. It can be set to instantly enable things like live speech to read text aloud or the magnifier as a visual aid. For even more power, you can use the action button to run shortcuts. That means you can use it to open any app of your choosing or to run a series of commands in an app or even your smart home. I think this is truly a game changer and is the perfect evolution of the classic silent switch. Next, let's dive into the camera features. I'll have a dedicated video coming on the iPhone 15 Pro camera, so be sure you subscribe for that. But let's talk about the leaps in camera hardware and software that make the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max so great for mobile photography. Built into the camera app are seven built-in focal lengths through computational photography, making the camera super versatile. Now I've seen some people online saying you're getting several different lenses, but that isn't the case. You still have three, but you can choose to crop into 1.2X and 1.5X for 28 and 35 millimeter equivalents respectively. The main 48 megapixel camera now captures even finer details at a crisp 24 megapixel resolution by default by taking a binned 12 megapixel image with the larger quad pixels for great low light detail and combining with the full 48 megapixel image with individual pixels so it picks up all the detail. Apple's photonic engine then goes to work applying deep fusion, smart HDR, and the entire image processing pipeline to give you excellent 24 megapixel photos with zero shutter lag. Of course, if you prefer the 12 megapixel images, you can just switch it up in settings, but I wouldn't. Another big one in the camera this year is 48 megapixel Heath. That's high efficiency image format. This allows you to take a full 48 megapixel image at a tremendously smaller file size five megabytes versus 75 megabytes when shooting a 48 megapixel shot in Pro Raw. Of course, videos taken on the iPhone 15 Pro continue to be industry leading as it pertains to quality as well. Whether you're using the camera for photos or video, you'll come away happy with the results. Now for me personally, the coolest camera feature on these new iPhones, both the 15 and 15 Pro, is the fact that when taking a picture, if it detects a person, dog, or cat, it'll automatically capture all the depth data, allowing you to change it into a portrait mode photo later after the fact. You can also do this by manually tapping on a subject in your photo as well. But the coolest part of all this is that you can even change the focal point of a photo later. This is like the holy grail 
of photo editing. And thanks to the power of computational photography, it's here in your iPhone. Now, everything I just mentioned applies to both the 15 Pro and Pro Max, but the iPhone 15 Pro Max boasts the biggest innovation. A Tetra Prism design enables a telephoto lens that achieves a 5X optical zoom range, giving you a 120 millimeter focal length with an F2.8 aperture enabling great close-ups from afar. Paired with the new 3D sensor shift image stabilization technology, even shots at full zoom stay crisp and steady as the sensor shift module moves in all three directions for the first time on any smartphone. This provides up to 10,000 micro adjustments per second, which is twice as many as the iPhone 14 Pro Max. Also for the first time, the Pro camera system meets the demands of professional filmmakers. Capturing log encoded ProRes video to external SSD drives enables cinema grade post-production workflows without having to eat into your iPhone storage. For mobile content creators, the iPhone 15 Pro Max just became the ultimate tool. Now powering all these new capabilities is the beastly new a17 Pro chip. It's a whole new architecture built on a three nanometer process with improvements to the CPU, GPU, and neural engine. The six core CPU is up to 10% faster thanks to these architectural improvements, making it the fastest CPU in any smartphone and rivaling speeds found even in desktop PCs. But the real news is the all new six core GPU. It introduces a totally redesigned architecture that amplifies graphics and gaming capabilities to levels never before seen in a smartphone. Demands of professional workflows like ProRes video and the new 48 megapixel camera output are easily met with dedicated imaging and video pipelines. And bleeding edge gaming features like hardware-based ray tracing create console quality visuals on an iPhone for the first time. Now I'll have a dedicated video coming on gaming on the iPhone 15 Pro as well, but let me just say that playing Resident Evil Village on a smartphone at this quality was insane. I can't wait to see how other games like Death Stranding and especially Assassin's Creed Mirage look with the power of the A17 Pro behind them. Next, I'm sure you were wondering how long it was gonna take me to get to it, but hey, Apple left us waiting on this one for years. It's the new USB-C port with high-speed connectivity, replacing the tried and true Lightning port. While convenient for compatibility with other Apple products and having a universal wire charging port built in, the biggest benefits are enjoyed by professional users here too. External storage and peripherals hook up effortlessly for fast, pro-grade workflows. With support for USB 3.2 Gen 2 data speeds, transferring huge files is incredibly fast. We're talking 10 gigabits per second, thanks to the new USB controller inside the A17 Pro chip. That's 20 times faster than what you'd see on last year's iPhone 14 Pro. You also get DisplayPort here, so you can plug into a monitor and output 4K at 60 frames per second in HDR. And side note, that doesn't just apply to the 15 Pro, but you can also do that with the standard iPhone 15 as well. The iPhone 15 Pro also picks up some additional features like Wi-Fi 6E, giving us an ultra modern, fast Wi-Fi standard at six gigahertz, which also allows for two times faster airdrop with other 6E devices. There's a thread radio in the iPhone that will allow you to connect directly to thread devices in your home without the need for a hub. That functionality is coming soon. And a second generation ultra wideband chip with three times farther range, which enables you to use precision finding in Find My Friends. Oh, and in addition to last year's emergency SOS via satellite, this year, Apple is adding roadside assistance via satellite so that you can contact help if you're stranded with no cellular service. The iPhone 15 Pro line shows Apple's aim to continue its push towards the high-end professional market. Power users across photography, videography, and other creative fields will find excellent new capabilities that they can put to use right away. That said, average consumers are gonna to struggle to justify year over year upgrades based on what many will see as relatively iterative changes to already exceptional iPhones. Now I never recommend people upgrade their smartphone annually. Those who do, do so knowing exactly why they're upgrading and which features stick out to them. If these are tools you use in your profession, the iPhone 15 Pro is an easy one to recommend. As always, early adopters will benefit most from leading edge Apple Silicon and camera engineering. That said, if you're coming from an older device, like an iPhone 12 Pro, 
there is more than enough here to give you that new iPhone feeling. The Apple Watch is the world's best selling watch for good reason. It's become an indispensable companion that not only helps keep you connected, but also more aware of your health and fitness goals. But with each new model, doubts arise. Has Apple pushed its iconic wearable to the limit? Is there anything groundbreaking left to add? I've been using the new Apple Watch Series 9 for just over a week now, and I can definitely say that Apple has put together an upgrade that's more impressive than we've seen over the past two years as it pertains to the Apple Watch. The highlight here is the new double tap gesture, which lets you control your watch like magic. And I know Apple calls everything magical, but being able to control your Apple Watch without touching it or even speaking to it really feels like a magic trick but more on that later first let's get into the unboxing as you can see here in addition to the series 9 apple did also send over one of the new nike sport watch bands which we will take a look at too getting into the series 9 itself you just remove this outer jacket and on the inside you'll find two boxes one for the apple watch itself and the other is the band that you chose to come with it opening this up we've got the apple watch series 9 in midnight aluminum. The fast charging cable is braided here, which matches the braided USB-C cables that Apple is including with the iPhone 15 series. Now, if this means that Apple is done with the rubbery white plastic cables from now on, that is fantastic as the braided cables are really nice. The aluminum Apple Watch itself has a ceramic back and Ion X glass on the front. If you want sapphire crystal instead, then you'll want to get the stainless steel model. The band included here is the midnight color as well matching up nicely with the Apple Watch itself, as you can see here. And despite both being called Midnight, the Apple Watch casing really does look like it's black, while the band is more of a really dark blue. Now, I mentioned that Nike Sport Band a moment ago. This one has an updated cool look as they're using recycled sport bands to make these. Those flecks of color you see in the bands are actually pieces of older sport bands, giving the Nike Sport Bands a nice, unique look. I like it. Next, let's talk about one of the most important aspects of any watch, the display. The display on the Apple Watch Series 9 received a major upgrade. It now reaches an incredible 2000 nits of maximum brightness, which is double that of the Series 8 and equal to the brightness of the original Apple Watch Ultra. This means that using the display in bright sunlight is truly effortless. Even better, even with a display that's two times brighter, the Series 9 still delivers the same 18 hour battery life as before. Oh, and in addition, the display can also dim down to an ultra low one nit of brightness when in sleep mode. This allows the screen to be visible in a dark room without disturbing your sleep while also preserving battery power. Next, let's talk more about that double tap feature. This is one of the most exciting new Apple Watch features in years. The double tap gesture lets you control your Apple Watch by just tapping your thumb and index finger together in a similar manner to how you select something in the Apple Vision Pro. No need to touch the display. Now, since Double Tap is coming later and isn't available at launch, Apple sent me a separate review unit, which has an early build of Double Tap in order for me to test it out. That's what you're seeing here on this pink Apple Watch Series 9. So as you can see, you simply double tap your index finger and thumb together, and the built-in accelerometer and new four-core neural engine detects the unique wrist movement pattern. This gesture can be used to play music, answer calls, stop timers, advanced notification widgets, and much more. It's especially useful when your other hand is tied up holding something. The double tap gesture makes interacting with the Apple Watch quicker and more convenient. Now, one other thing on this, I've been seeing some questions from you guys as well as to why this is only available on the Series 9 when similar gesture controls are available as assistive touch accessibility features on earlier Apple Watch models. Now, the answer here is that while the gesture might be similar, how they work behind the scenes is very different. Assistive touch gestures are designed for accessibility needs for people who can't use or don't have another hand to operate the Apple Watch. It runs on the main CPU of the watch Watch, which ends up consuming battery power as a background process and requires specific customization for all the different actions that you would do with the gesture. This can be a compromised experience for users who don't require it. The gestures are also prompted in the Apple Watch interface whenever they're available to the user. This is different from Double Tap, which is implemented as part of WatchOS 10 and runs on the new neural engine on the S9 SIP 
making it much more power efficient and optimized for all users of the Apple Watch. There's no setup, there's no customization process, and no prompting the user when there was a double tappable gesture available. Up next, let's talk precision finding. Have you ever spent 15 minutes searching for a lost iPhone in your home? The Apple Watch Series 9 aims to eliminate that with the new precision finding feature. Just go into the control center and ping your iPhone, and now it'll use the integrated second gen ultra wideband chip to show you the precise distance and direction to your paired iPhone, even if it's in a another room. As you get closer, haptics and audio cues will guide you directly to your iPhone. This takes the experience of misplacing your iPhone from frustrating to kind of fun. Then there's on-device Siri. Now, Siri requests are processed directly on the watch itself rather than needing to connect to the cloud. This means faster response times, improved accuracy, and greater privacy. You can even access your personal health data now, like sleep, heart rate, medications, and more using just your voice for the first time. The more powerful neural engine makes dictation up to 25% more accurate too. Now, I use Siri all the time on my Apple Watch, mostly for smart home control and to dictate messages. And the difference here is very noticeable. Of course, this is all powered by the new S9 system and package. Now, while the Apple Watch does get a new SIP each year, that doesn't necessarily mean that it gets a fast faster CPU each year. So here, for the first time in three years, does. The Apple Watch Series 9 delivers up to 60% faster performance than the previous model, thanks to its dual-core CPU and up to 30% faster graphics from the GPU. The S9 also has Apple's most advanced four-core neural engine as well, which is critical for machine learning tasks like detecting the double tap feature, as I mentioned just a minute ago. The Series 9 has lots of other great additions too, like new experiences for cycling workouts, mind mindfulness, and tracking time spent in daylight exposure. Oh, and also a huge milestone, any aluminum Series 9 or SE paired with a sport loop band is actually carbon neutral, which is a first for any Apple product. The company is clearly committed to greatly reducing its environmental impact, which I think is something we can all appreciate. From game-changing additions like the double tap gesture and on-device Siri to an even brighter always-on display and enhanced S9 chip, the Series 9 delivers. It retains everything people love about the Apple Watch like 18-hour battery life and comprehensive health sensors while continually pushing us into the future. I think it's safe to say the best smartwatch in the world just got even better with the Apple Watch Series 9. I remember like we're calling using my nose to do something on my Apple Watch. Or like, <laughs> I've like, done that. like really? answering, answering a call, yep. like someone's calling me, I have something in my hand or I'm doing something and then using my nose to actually answer a call. So imagine just being able to do this to answer the call now. Right. So, or use your tongue, just but, uh, <laughs> do what you can. I, I never you do used, what you can. I never right. use the tongue to, to answer. <laughs> you guys are getting pretty so, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what did you guys think yesterday? I Apple think, event. Okay. I mean, it was, um, it was just like I expected it to be. It was like... Um, like a lot of excitement. I know people were just waiting. Tim came out, you know, people got that energy mm -hmm, going. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. But uh, yeah, there was some things that were expected and not expected. I mean, what about you? Um, yeah, you mentioned Tim coming out. People at home don't see that actually. That's true. So that's just a little, a little treat for us here at Apple Park. We get the hello, we get the good morning with the, with the clapping and the, and the, and the, the uproar. Um, and then when you're watching at home, you get this more subdued good morning. And uh, one thing that's interesting, you know, aside from all the announcements, is that when we are seeing the announcements and hearing stuff, and we're hearing the applause happen, so they announce something, the applause happens, and it's like exciting, right? But when you're at home, you hear none of that. Mm -hmm. right. You just hear, yeah. like, I, was, I went back to the Vision Pro when I watched it, and he's like, we have one more thing. And it was like so different when he says we have one more thing, and it's just silence. Yeah. Whereas when we were there, you hear everybody like getting super hyped up. So, um, but yeah, but for, as far as the event went, I was more, I think there were more things that surprised me than, than that were just things I expected to see. Okay. okay. In interesting. Um, yeah, so it wasn't very. It, Wait, I, last time, for, by the way, last time we were on the Mac Rumors podcast. I know what you're going to say, here. yeah. Okay, and yeah. you said you don't follow these I things. I don't follow rumors because I, I, I want to be surprised when I go. Right. I don't want to go with expectations or anything. So it wasn't very product heavy, but mm -hmm. I did like the changes and the things that were announced, right? So Apple Watch, you know, year over year they make a new Apple Watch. Yep. I didn't expect the gesture control. I'm not sure if that was something that was going to be rumored or anything, but that was that was like really cool. And I was thinking yep. about ways 
I would use that on my Apple Watch, right? I was mm -hmm. thinking about ways I could implement that into everyday life. Because there's been many times where I was doing something. I remember like recalling using my nose to do something on my Apple Watch. <laughs> or like, I've like, done that. A, like really? answer, answering a call. Yep. Like someone's calling me. I have something in my hand or I'm doing something. And then using my nose to actually answer a call. So imagine just being able to do this to answer the call. Now. Right. So, or use your tongue just... But, uh, uh, <laughs> do what you can. I, I you never do use, what you can. I never right. use the tongue to, to answer. <laughs> you guys are getting pretty so, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I, I, I was happy about that. Um, I was happy with obviously the new iPhone, uh, iPhone Pro. Yep. Um, I was enjoying the the action button. It's mm -hmm. it's it's the first change for a very long time. It wasn't the mute switch or the mute toggle there from the original iPhone? Yeah, from the original. So like, I mean, first time so ever. That is the first time that has changed, yes. right? So the very first time it's changed. So, you know, things like that is just, it's really hard to change everything year over year, but new materials, new camera system, new button, USB-C, I mean, what what is there more that you could ask for, right? Got a lot. So I was very, I was very, I was very happy. Okay, yeah, let, let's let's jump into uh, some of these announcements. So first was the, the video, the opening video, right? where we got a look at how Apple's different technologies end up basically, save, for lack of a better term, they're saving lives, yeah. right? Whether it's rescuing people who are stranded somewhere um, or alerting people to a potential heart issue with right. their Apple Watch. Um, for right. me, I always, I always love seeing those. I know it's, it's kind of controversial because some people think Apple is using the fact that these products can save lives as a, as a selling tax, like for sales, to, to, but why wouldn't you? Of course, like why yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, just it. The thing is that it's these are things that you don't think about when you're getting into a car crash. You're not you're not thinking right. about that. It just happens, mm -hmm. right? And then the, these these services and these features are built for that. Yeah, for, and to, to yeah. save your life. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, I have, I have, an, I have an elderly father, and through his insurance, they actually got him an Apple Watch. Mm. And it sends uh, like reports, like health reports, to a doctor. So, um, and they they look at his graphs when he when he comes to the doctor's office. They look at his graphs, how it's been for the past month. Instead of just like wow. recording it right then and there, they have like a month a month like running log of it. And so, seeing that, and then me having access to his data and health data, and when he goes to the doctors, I can bring the reports up and stuff like that. And I don't have to hear it from him, and you know stuff like that. Just is like. Yeah, like I, I totally get it because you know at first, at first a long time ago when they're announcing all this health stuff, I'm like, man, this is kind of like Ugh, all this health stuff. But then it, it impacts me, so it's like it's one of those things where it's like, wow, I like I totally get it now. Like it, it, it gives me a peace of mind to know like what's happening when Dad goes to the doctor. Yeah, I wonder what age these things start applying to you because I'm sure there's people out there that are, you know, I don't know. I'm just picking a random number. You're 23 years old. Yeah, and you're seeing all these features announced, and you're like. I don't care. That was I me. I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't need a heart. I don't yeah. need to watch my heart rate. That was literally me. Yeah, right? that, that was me. Yeah. But th there's a certain age where you hit where it's like, oh, that that sounds good. Yeah. Right. And then the fall yeah. detection. Right. Then there's another. Yeah. Age. Uh oh, I, I'm I'm not steady on my feet anymore. I need that. Yeah. But medical conditions go for all ages. Exactly. So yeah, I used to before I used to do tech. I used to be an ER nurse. So like you can see a lot of people. Some people you think, oh, there's no way that this. 15 year old can have the same ailment that an 80 year old has but sometimes you have like congenital heart stuff and even my wife has svt so um like she'll get rapid heart rates all the time and then she has her apple watch and she just takes that two lead ekg real quick and she's like oh my god i'm i'm at like 150 you know so it's so a like it, it's she legitimate it help time. yeah i mean it's it's, it's 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 a cool tool to have if you if you have those kind of right things, right know, emergency calls and things you might need to make so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always there on your wrist. So I think it's it's kind of underrated. I agree. I agree. Uh, let's talk about Apple Watch. That was the first hardware announcement we got yesterday. And so for the first time in, I believe, let's see, it was Series 6. Series 6 got a pretty substantial um, processor boost. And then 7 and 8, they had different chips, but they were like the same speed. So if they add anything to the chip, whether it's, you know, it's a more sensitive motion tracker or anything like that, it's a new series of chip, but it doesn't mean the actual CPU has changed. Yeah. So the CPU hasn't changed since for, for three generations. So now we're getting right. a newer CPU, um, faster, uh, twice as fast neural engine. And that neural engine is what's allowing for what seems to be, based on conversations I've had with people, the most exciting feature of the day, which was the double tap. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. Really on the Apple that. Watch. Yeah. So, did you guys try that? 
I did. I thought it was really cool. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy, though, because I think people were saying right. that in accessibility, you were able to do something very similar yes. before in the past watches. Yes. So, uh, that's a lot of questions that I saw is like, why when it come to the other okay. Apple watches? Okay. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Actually, um, I don't have I don't just have thoughts. I have an answer. Oh, I have an answer okay. on that one. Mm. So, as you mentioned, there is the accessibility features, and I don't, I don't remember what all those gestures were, but all of those gestures run on the main CPU, and the way that they're detected is different. And so, since the double tap is more of a, like a core feature that, that's gonna be put into like any app, or at least all the first party apps, and then developers can add it to their, to their notifications, mm. That's running on the neural engine. And the twice as fast neural engine is what's being used in this generation for that specific um, gesture, for the double tap gesture. And I assume any other future gestures that we might see uh, will, be, will be running there as well. So it's just where, where it's processed is different and the method that the um, accessibility stuff is processed um, is different than this. I don't know why it's different. My assumption, and this is just my assumption, is when you have accessibility features, you kind of want the, like, if I double tap and it doesn't work the first time, maybe right. I'm just a little bit frustrated, right? Oh, whatever, I just do it again. But if I'm, if I have a need that this gesture, you know, I, I'm, I rely on it, I want that to work every time, right? So that's kind of, that's just my assumption. Maybe it's running on the main CPU instead of the neural engine so that it has more power allotted to those things so that for people who really need them to work at all times. But again, that part um, is just my, my speculation. Okay. I yeah. like that. It's a more of a, I feel like it's more of an extension of accessibility yeah. because I think it's good for us to use, but I think it takes accessibility to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you tried was, double tap? Yeah, I did. Yeah, the um, I I enjoyed the pacing of it because a lot of people were like going too fast, and mm. just it's a it's like a smooth pacing. It's just a like right. It's very, it's very very smooth with it. But for me, I always think about how I could use something right, and like how the the apps that I use on my Apple Watch every day, like how would that really come into play? Like if I'm listening to music and just pause the music really quick, or you know anything like that. So you know, I, I think I think it's cool. Any any way I can access something differently i'm always i'm always down for it and, and like i said before the whole concept of using my nose to answer a call and now just <laughs> to answer a call because I, I answer a lot of calls on my watch like more than really yeah because i i put my phone down a lot i don't know where i'm at in the house or my son has my phone wh whatever happens so i, I i'm i'm like literally having full conversations on my watch often airpods are just like just on the watch just just, just, just kind of like hanging out dick tracy like 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 whispering <laughs> like like whispering what? things yeah i, I don't know why are you whispering I, I don't know you know the whole thing like you talking to your cuff link about <laughs> yeah you know it's, it's that whole concept I don't, I don't know i just end up talking on the, the watch a lot sometimes i take the watch off and just set it next to me and i'm like on my laptop no, you're and i'm not i promise that I promise works you, it, do, it does work pretty well actually i thought once you take your watch off it's like you're not authenticated anymore. It still it still works. Like if I'm on a, if if I'm currently on a phone call, yes, I could take it off mid. -call. Take it off mid call. Mid call. Mid call. Mid -call. Just hang it up. <laughs> Just hang it over something. Yeah. Software patch coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Danny, you, you use your watch for calls. Not really, no, Man. because I, I just I can't have you know I'm I'm that person that doesn't like speaker phone calls in public yeah. and stuff like that. I can't do it. I'm at I don't home. Know about you guys. I'm at home. Wait, let me go back. True at home. But, <laughs> let me go back to Apple Watch though. So, just in general. What do you generally find yourself using your Apple Watch for, aside from phone calls? Like, yeah. do you do you use it to the like the max ability? Like, I find that it's like tracking health stuff in the background, right? Yeah. Just in the background. Yeah. Um, if I'm actively doing some sort of workout or going for a walk or whatever, I will I will turn that on, and I I look for my notifications. But I'm not like. I feel like there's a lot of features that I could be using that I almost forget. Yeah. And like, I'll just take out my phone to do something when I could have done it on my watch. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of it, though. There's, there's, so, much, there's so much technology baked into all these products that every person has a different niche for it, right? Like, for me, the Apple Watch is the best golfing watch available. I have a Garmin that's a $700 Garmin watch, and compared to the Apple Watch, the Apple Watch is still better 
a better golfing watch than the Garmin. The Garmin is a golfing watch. It's I made see. It's made for golfing. It has like some health stuff kind of baked in and stuff like that, but it's actually designed for golfing. It's a golfing watch, but the Apple Watch is better than the Garmin golfing watch. How so? Um, the display is larger. The display is bigger. Um, battery life isn't as good, but you also can use different apps. The Garmin, you're stuck to the Garmin app, right? You're stuck mm. to their app. Apple Watch has five different golfing apps. And there's actually an, an app that uses the accelerometer to, like, I don't want to get too nerdy on golf, but, no, like, just go, please, all, all, about, <laughs> all about wrist angles, right? There's an oh. app that, that you can practice your golf swing, and it tells you your wrist angles. And when your wrist goes in the wrong position, it buzzes. So, it, like, it teaches you how to do a proper swing right on your own wrist. Like, tempo training, like, you want to swing at a certain speed or you want to slow down or you're too fast, the watch will tell you how fast you're moving and all those things. So, it will literally draw a diagram of your actual swing. And that's like that's an app you just buy on you for your Apple Watch. So it's just so that right there makes me just use an Apple Watch for golf all the time. But same thing for working out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I you know, whatever, I do like a workout class and just having the stats compared to the stats that they provide in a workout class and they're like one to one. So I have like their wrist, you know, their armband on there, I have an Apple Watch right here, and it's giving me the exact same stats, calories burned and, and everything like that. So I think it's really cool. And then I, I've done one hike before. One hike. One. And I noticed how the Apple Watch adjusted to that because I was doing a hike. Like, it had, like, the breadcrumbs of where I went, elevation changes, and, and, and things like that. So, I don't know. Like, I, I think as I explore different types of workouts and different types of things, the Apple Watch usually has something for that at this point, which, mm -hmm. I, which I think is really cool. Yes. The other thing I use my Apple Watch a lot for is finding my phone. Where'd I put my phone? <laughs> yes. Where'd my phone yes, right? Yes, for sure. Um, and they added something new. So, yesterday they announced when you ping your phone, it will also, on the new Series 9 and Ultra 2, bring you into the Find My experience. So I actually thought that was a different, like, do I want Find My or do I just want to make the, no, if you make the noise, it'll automatically mm. direct you towards your phone. Um, you need to have a Series 9 or Ultra 2 and an iPhone 15. Right, because it's the ultra wide band right. chip. Yeah. The second gen, you know, wider ultra wide band. I don't think it works in reverse, so. Find, yeah. your, find your watch. Yeah, there's no find your watch. That'd be with nice. The, with the, yeah. You can find your watch in the find my app, but yeah, not with sure. the precision. Yeah, with the precision. Yeah, that's the, find that's, that's the big one, yeah. Um, and then there was the, I think that was it for the Series 9, right? It was mostly the double tap, yeah. faster processor. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Siri on um, like Oh, on Siri device. on device, which is I actually I think that's nice. a big one, too. That's a great yeah. one. Can't forget that. Yeah, because it's not, it's not going to, so anything that has to go through the internet is still going to have some sort of latency, like. I was originally thinking, because I use Siri for the smart home, like I can just talk to Siri and then yeah. instant, but it's still going to have to hop to the internet to mm -hmm. process that because it's a smart home. But if you're asking for anything that doesn't involve uh, an internet request, it's just instant now, which is which is great, which is nice, especially for um, anything that has to do with like dictating. So you're dictating a text message or anything like that. It uses large language model now. so similar to like the AI, chat GPT kind of stuff, they have that built in. And where they, just based on what you're saying, they kind of know what you sh are likely saying next, match that with what you actually say, and then figure out how to like, have a really precise um, transcript of, of what you just said, which is cool. Okay, so then there was Apple Watch Ultra 2. You, you wear the Ultra. Yeah. What, what do you have, Danny? What, what you got? I usually wear the Ultra, but uh, I'm kind of the, uh, the anti, like, uh, I guess I, I like smartwatches, but then mm. I love it when I take it off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird thing, man. I I'm like smartwatches. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I understand exactly. But I love yeah, you know what I mean, it though, because yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. I get a lot of double notifications and things yeah. that I don't want on the watch. Now, I use it strictly for fitness. That I like a lot. But, yeah, if my watch of choice is definitely the Ultra because just strictly on the screen size and battery life. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, battery the battery life. life is great. And it's like all the other watches, including other Apple watches, I've struggled charging it every single day because sometimes I just don't, I just forget. But I yeah. like that I can get a, at least a guaranteed two day battery life out of that. So, yeah, we, we talk about battery life and kind of go back to the golf example, yeah. right? So, up until the, the, the Ultra, um, I couldn't track a whole round of golf. Well, I could, but I had to charge the watch in the car. So, like 100%, now I'm playing, playing golf. And then by the time I'm done playing, it's like at 5%. Now I can do a whole round, and I'm still, like, at 45, 50, 60 how, how, how long is a – just for context. Yeah, about, it's, it's about four hours, but it's, but it's constantly tracking everything. It's, it's tracking your location, your distance, your, your walking, and your heart rate because it, it tracks it as a workout, too. Mm -hmm. 
So it's kind of double, it's tracking, like all the sensors are firing off at the yeah. same time, right? So it's very taxing on the battery. And the Ultra is the only watch that you can literally play around in golf without even thinking about charging it ahead of time or anything like that. And just the peace of mind, because I used to just have to plug it in in the car, and then when I'm about to play, unplug it, put it, put it on, and then plug it in when I'm done type of thing. Mm. And sometimes it would die mid-round. So now I can get everything without thinking about it. So, so the Ultra, when you talk, talk about battery life, especially, you know, we travel a lot too, and not have to really worry about, man, make sure I dock it every single night. Just just know that it, it's there, and then you put in the low power mode and get even more time with it if you need to. Right. Do you think, do you think that 3,000 nit display, which was new on this one, do you think that's going to help you in golf, though? Do you ever have a problem mm. with your current Ultra now? No. not Seeing it in bright daylight? No, I've, I've never ran into an issue with it like that. I've, I've okay. Because everything I need to see is just really big numbers. So maybe if it's like small or fine details, but typically it just has like the distance of where I am and nothing real fine details. So I, I don't have a problem with that today. Still crazy though, I suspect. 3,000 3, nits is that's incredible. Wild, that's, I mean, Yeah, I, I can't even figure out how bright that is. Like in, in my head, I, you say something 3,000 nits. I don't know I don't know what that looks like. Right. No, there's a reason because I don't know any what displays do we ever. I don't think there's ever, any other watch out there. Like our TVs, which are here, are usually like a thousand nits is amazing for yeah. HDR TV. Yeah. Um, the iPhone, twenty five hundred, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Last I mean, year? I don't think anything really hits that. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, that's is, peak brightness. Right. But peak brightness yeah. on HDR. So, yeah, this is going to be like when you're out in direct sunlight. For like direct sunlight, right? Yeah. 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 Which. I guess when you golf, direct sunlight is not what you want to golf in, right? That, that sounds <laughs> I mean, terrible. It, it happens, but but like I said, it's very glanceable. It's just glanceable. I'm not looking at something, but I I would imagine if you're like in Arizona on a on a trail, it's going to look a lot, lot different than me golfing yeah. in Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there, there's different level of Bermuda right? grass and everything. Out there. <laughs> yeah, you know Andrew's a grass expert, expert now. I taught him all about grass. <laughs> well, he did. He did. I know yeah. how to just with touch grain, the grass. Yeah, and with I know grain, against is. grain, all that mm -hmm. stuff. I know, yeah. I know all but, about that. But it's just. But once again, like. Even if you don't need the spec, knowing the spec is there, just in case that one time you need it is, is good. So that's so it's like 3,000 3, nits, fine. Like yeah. that's good. Maybe I'll never use it, but the one time I need it, I'll say, oh, this, wow, I, I can see my watch. But I like specs that are out of the way, like something you don't have to consider. It's just it's there helping you along the way. You don't mm -hmm. have to think about like, wow, this 3,000 nit screen really kicked in right now. Like that, right, right. That's, that's not how I walk around talking. So right, and that, and that's Apple's thing, right? Is there's the specs are in there, but it's it's not there to just be a spec right it's there to help you when you need it like like you said you can't you can't turn the brightness up to 3000 and say look at my 3000 nits right it's like when you need it it'll do it when you don't need it it's not going to do it on the opposite end of that though now it goes down to one nit as well that's nice yeah so like in dark conditions that's going to oh, it went from two yeah. to one so now you're gonna be able to save battery life when you. Okay. So that's that. I misheard that. Yeah. I misheard. I thought I thought they were talking about for some reason like the refresh rate goes down to. One. I thought they were talking about one hertz. No. Like the nit. phone. Oh yeah. It's I was one like, nit now. but one goes down to one. Yeah. Nit. So that's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm all about that. These are little things that always add up to big. Yep. Ones. Yep. Speaking of which, little things that add up to big ones. Let's transition over AirPods. They didn't really talk about this at all. It no, they like did not. Not too much. Just didn't get mentioned. Yeah. It yeah. They, they, just a little. They touched on it because there's the new USB-C case, right? Yep. Now, Kevin, you said you don't follow the rumors. Do you follow rumors? It's almost impossible not to. That's what I was going to yeah. ask you. It's like I just still see it through my. I don't feet, know how right? you avoid you know? it. I just <laughs> oh. I just scroll like that. <laughs> How does that feature work? <laughs> you just scroll, I scroll away like that. <laughs> so, so we have these new AirPods, right? Um, USB-C case. Now, previously, Apple had AirPods Pro and regular AirPods before, and then they released a new case, which was a MagSafe case, right? So same AirPods, new case, and anyone that bought AirPods from then on would get the new case, and anyone who wanted the new case could just buy the case and put their old AirPods in it, right? And that's kind of what the rumor mill kind of expected here. We weren't going to get AirPods Pro 3. Yeah. We were just going to get a new case. Well, apparently, that's not completely accurate. The, these AirPods have a new case, but the actual physical AirPods are redesigned a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. I thought not, it was software stuff. No, no, no. It is, they are redesigned slightly. So now they have... Uh, water and dust resistance, okay. whereas AirPods Pro 2 did not, they had one or the other, I forget, but the, the current ones have a water and dust rating. And secondly, only the ones that were announced yesterday will work 
with Apple Vision Pro as lossless wireless audio headphones. Interesting, okay. So if you have the AirPods Pro 2 that came with the lightning connector, they will not, they will still work with the Vision Pro, but not lossless audio. So Apple has re-engineered or added something with the antennas to make, to allow for lossless audio, again, with Vision Pro only, so not with like your iPhone or anything else. So, but at the same time, they're still called AirPods Pro, you know, second gen. With USB-C? Yeah, with USB-C. Okay. Hmm. So that's, are they calling it with USB-C or is it? I, that I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah. tell by looking at the at the at the case, right? And there was some software yeah. features too, right? Some new ones. I think there's, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's uh, adaptive yes. transparency mode now, right? Adaptive, yeah. So those software features are just part of iOS 17 okay. for AirPods Pro Gen 2, both 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 versions of Gen 2. See, that's that's why it's confusing, yeah, right? right? Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's two different versions of are, a Gen 2 product. Are they pulling Gen 2 like off the shelf now or or just going for or, or you go, when you go to store and buy one can you say I want USB-C I want lightning or is it just That's a good question. Yeah. I would guess that it's just the USB-C version from now on. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was the thinking because they actually pulled the battery pack, the MagSafe battery pack with lightning. That's no longer for sale. Really? Okay. And um, there was one other thing. Oh, MagSafe Duo no longer for sale. Because that's a lightning product as well. Yeah, I still have mine. I'm just like, oh, I can't get rid of this lightning cord just yet. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, get get something else. Get the, get the Mofi. Yeah, Mofi yeah. has one that's and it does three instead of two. Oh, yeah, it's a little cheaper. But um, I guess they're trying to fa- phase it out. I mean, there's still the like the the Magic Mouse and the Magic Trackpad. Um, yeah. Obviously, AirPods Max. Yeah, but that'll be interesting. They the, did the eliminate. Transition. Yeah, this transition is going to be interesting to see. Um, so yeah, but that's AirPods. So same price. If if this wasn't even like you said, it wasn't announced yesterday. These are just like little tidbits that I still don't totally understand why. Like, if you have a new version of a product, usually you want people to know. Yeah. Vision Pro is coming early next year. If you want lost this audio, we have a brand new pair. Like, they didn't do that though. So it's it's like a more on the DL. Yeah, I think sustainability took a lot of time up. Mm. You know, I think they have like a set yep. time. Yep. They want to do the same. Speaking of which, Mother Nature. Yeah. That Mother was Nature. Co- that was cool. That was a funny. Think? That was funny, though, I have to say. That was you great. Know? Yeah. It was a good approach. You got to see, like, uh, you know, like Tim being funny and just like, I don't know. There was just a lot of mm-hmm. stuff to it. I think it was really cleverly done. I mean, that's the one thing I always have to say about Apple's video team and the yeah. stuff that they produce is just incredible, man. And you just watch it and you get blown away. And I thought it was good, though. I thought it was a good segment. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. she she's an amazing actress. I I, I don't want to get her name wrong, unfortunately, because I have like three names in my head. I don't want to get it wrong. Mm. But she's an amazing actress. Every, every movie she's in, she she does a great job. And and I think fantastic. Yeah. I think the the message behind it was great. And I think they were able to like rifle off some stats that otherwise. Could have been a little boring, to be yes, honest. Yes, absolutely. But rifle off stats in a funny way mm-hmm. that we still got the message and entertained at the same time. And that's kind of the goal of anything. You want to entertain people and give a message so you walk away laughing but still informed. Yeah. I think they did a great job uh, maximizing that. Yeah, I almost felt in a way like we all make videos, right? And we all, a lot of people who make videos about the the niche that we're in really focus on specs, Right. And that video, as I was watching it, I was like, "This, this is what it. This is really what it is. Like they're giving us all the specs in a way that's entertaining. They're not just like, because they have in the past taken the stage and be like, let's talk sustainability, right? And then everybody on Twitter is like, this is the most boring part. What are they doing? Just get to the phone. And I didn't feel that at all when I was watching this. I was just like, you know, a lot of times when I'm watching a piece of content, I'm always like trying to relate it back to like what we do. And I was like. There's something to be learned here. Like, how do we keep it? Anyone, anyone can watch that video yesterday. Anyone can watch that segment. They don't have to be interested in iPhones. They don't have to be interested in the environment. They don't have to be interested in sustainability. Anyone can watch that and walk away entertained. And right. that's like, that's how I want my stuff to be too. And right. so it was like a cool reminder. I need to see your review like that, man. Mm, see, well, I, I mean... <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's a slow, it's a slow transition, slow change, right? <laughs> like I don't, it's it's hard yeah. to like. It's it's theorizing, 
and it's planning like how to do it like it, it's not something you can just say oh i like that and then like your next video is just right. boom right because your old habits die hard and everything but it's definitely something that kind of made me take notice for sure and say to myself like how i watched that and didn't feel bored at all but still got all the information that's how i want to be able to present information it's tough man that's a, that's a never, that's the never ending battle right that is that's, that's battle. a battle for all of us all right let's get to the start of the show iphones yeah iPhones, iPhone 15. Now we're all iPhone users. We all carry around our iPhones. Um, iPhone 15 gets the 48 megapixel camera, not the exact same one that the uh, 14 Pro had, but same resolution. And I thought that was a pretty big deal because they gave the um, they gave the 2x, mm-hmm. which essentially for the first time on a non-pro iPhone, gives you three yeah. optical lenses. Yep. Three optical, what do you call it? Not lenses, but... Choices. Choices. Yeah, yeah focal length. Focal so, length. Yeah, focal, focal length. yeah. So you can go 2X and get the full, because it's just going into the center of the sensor. Because of the sensor and the megapixel size, right. they're able yeah, to yeah, bend and also exactly. bend the output is 24. Right, so you get a 24... It's fantastic. Which is cool. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to do that mm-hmm. without a third sensor yeah mm-hmm. what do you think Danny I, I want to hear from you because uh, I know you have opinions on cameras anyone who's yeah. watched Danny's channel he's all about the cameras that's the thing that I was most excited about for sure um, looking at that part of it I think the iPhone 15 actually is a little bit underrated I, at first I was thinking the same thing I was like ah you know what this is I think people are gonna pass this by mm-hmm. But then I have to then switch my mode into an average consumer yes. of what they would buy. And I think having Dynamic Island and having these pro features that we saw last year on the essential, like, you know, just iPhone 15, you're just going to get that right off the bat. I wasn't thinking that way. And I'm thinking, well, you get a lot of pro features. You're getting upgrade, updated cameras. And, mm-hmm. and I know I know some people are like, oh, I don't like the, that it's got the older last generation processor, but it's like. The processor is already great. Right. Like, who cares about that? Don't don't get me started on that. Curve. At this, at this, and we're getting point, started on it. And I know some people will do that, but I think it was really interesting this year, though, where they definitely segmented the 15 Pro and the Pro Max. Yes. With the zoom, I thought that mm-hmm. was a little bit. Uh, it wasn't we. It wasn't weird because I know they they've, they've done this in the past, but. Yep. I was praising them for unifying the pro lineup because the cameras were the same. And I was like, oh, this is great because right. people that want that smaller phone, but th- that want that power. But now you have to get the pro max mm-hmm. to get that 5X zoom. Yes. I mean, what do you think about that? And well, it makes sense. Like the the reasoning that they gave both um, size, I think. Yeah, it's the size. So basically the module that they used would just would not fit into the smaller pro. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't that was not a periscope lens, right? It is, yeah. It is it, a periscope it, it, lens. The way they, they do it is it's it's a different. But it seems type, like it's a so, it's, it's not it's not like it's a solid one. Like yeah, it's just the way that they're refracting light, different things. It's in a smaller package, mm-hmm. and um, the thing I found like super geeked out about was that it the, the stabilization is incredible. It's not just doing an X Y. It's going on. Oh the yeah, it's going on too. Yeah. So it's like yeah, that's, that's you're getting really good. You're getting all types of incredible stabilization on that. So that's where I'm looking forward to the most on that is photography is going to be great, but the five X zoom video is what I'm looking forward mm-hmm. to. Because and, and that's the pro, by the way. So yeah, let, let's let's stay on the stay on the okay, main stay 15 on the, first. Kevin was about to get mad about people people hating on last year's processor. Yeah, I don't like talk, people... talk to me. Okay, so the thing is, like, what exactly are you doing on your phone where last year's processor is going <laughs> to hinder you? Because that's the thing that bothers me that, you know, people in the comments will, will say that. Because, you know, I make a video and they're yeah. like, oh, it has last year's processor. But but what are, you, what are you doing, though? Like, what exactly are you doing every day where you need the newest processor? If you want the newest processor, go with the pro version of the right. phone. You know what I mean? Like, people make a fuss and they stare at these spec sheets all day long and compare phones on spec sheets. They just don't use the thing, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I I was just using CapCut on on my phone j- just today, yeah. editing 4K 60 frames per second video. So smooth and so fast. Can you imagine doing that five years ago? Oh, absolutely. Can you imagine doing Impossible. that? It, it's just people, people get so ahead of themselves and they stare at these spec sheets and, and they don't understand what goes into upgrading things and upgrading processors and the price of parts and, mm-hmm. and all those things. And it just, it just makes me really upset that people <laughs> will go to GSM Marina and just look at that all day and think they have the experience of using a product. And, and right. they'll argue you as someone who uses the product for a living 
and talks about it mm -hmm. for a living. Sorry about sorry about the rant. Guys. No, no, no. Question though. No, but that's our but that's our audience only, right? Not the general people. Question no, for, for sure. Yeah. Were you ever that person? No. Never. Never. You were never someone. Even like no. you know, ten years ago, the specs is what matters. Yo, I don't know, man. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think I was ever that way. Like like one hundred percent. Because I, I, I'm all. I'm still all about experience. I'm all yeah. about using it. And then if I run into something that hinders me from continue to use it a certain way, then I'll Makes look sense. at that stuff. But I am a very. Per, I'm a person who like my, my mom would. Oh, my mom would tell me that. She can tell me anything she wants. She can say, this will hurt, this will make you bleed or whatever. I have to do it myself. I've always been that way, and I'm still that way. Like, I need to use something to really understand it. So I, I can't just look at the back of the box and then yeah. have the full experience. That, that's never been me. Okay. Never been me. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that was the camera. The other thing about the camera is if it sees a human, yep. if it sees a dog, or if it sees a a cat, it will automatically, without you having to do anything more, capture all of the depth data automatically. Yeah, I believe it's also if you tap to focus on an object. Yes, yes, it will, yeah. but that's not automatic though. So yeah. the other option, true, true. If, you yes. tap, if you tap on something, it would also capture it, but automatically if there's a, a person, a dog or a cat, it just captures it, whether you ask it to or not. And then using that data, you can later go in and take a look at the photo and change the focal point. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts. Yeah, it's just once again another example of tech getting out of the way and just just doing it in the background for you, right? Um, per personally, it'll be nice to not have to go to portrait mode and I can just snap photos of my kid right. or, or whatever and then go back later and, and turn it to a portrait photo or compare it like, you know what, as a portrait, you know, I like it better when it's not portrait. I like to see the background more, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So I'm, I'm all for that. And I was sort of thinking about it like, People, people who use their cameras who are just like average consumers or what have you, they're not going into different modes and going into portrait and taking photos, but they have the ability now to take a photo. But then I was thinking that same person is not going back to edit that photo to make it a portrait picture too. So mm. I wish there was a way that um, you take a photo, then you have two copies saved, one portrait, one regular, and then that person can decide which one they like, you know, swipe the one away you don't like type of yeah. thing. Yeah, no, you just select the photo in the, in the photos app and you just tap on duplicate. Yeah, or something like that. No, yeah. they have it. Oh, That's okay. what I'm saying. That's all you do. You like you you tap on the three dots and you just tap duplicate and then it just copies. Okay. So yeah. you can because I was saying like maybe That's you want cool. both versions where you're in focus and then you want the one right. You want both of them, right? Yeah, for sure. So you can just duplicate it and then edit. So yeah. That's nice. Um, and then 24 megapixels by default now. Sure. Not 12 megapixel anymore. And I, I think you can if you go in the settings. I think you can you can pick. Oh, you can pick, so you yeah. can still choose the 12 if you want to. Yeah, okay. I don't know why you would want that, but I mean, you, I think you can. Okay, interesting. I sure. saw that yeah. in the settings. There was a lot of stuff in the settings, though, too, that they weren't talked about. I don't know if you saw that. Like, mm. um, uh, I think uh, for the pros, mm -hmm. so you can shoot pro, uh, you can shoot pro raw. Um, they, they have log, SDR, HDR, and yep. log, which is something that I wasn't expecting at all. Ridiculous. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And the focal length changes on the main camera. If you mm -hmm. tap on the One X, it'll go into I think 24 millimeter, 28 millimeter, yep. and 35, 35 millimeter, which is really cool. So just effective, like I think it's 1.2, 1.5 yes. yep. afterwards. And, it's, and then you it's, can select which one you want to be your default. As your default, yeah. Yes. Yes. Which is kind of neat if you like a certain focal length. I don't think this will be for everyone, which is kind of cool because it's kind of not hidden, but you have to kind of tap it. Do you, yeah. do you find, like, it's just to my, in my head, it sounds like there's, there's so subtle one, 1 1.2, 1.5, like, is there really much of a difference there? I think it's just more for uh, portrait photography. Yeah. And that mm. you want to go into certain yeah. you know, and, lenses. And people buy lenses. People will buy a 28 millimeter lens and a 35 and a 24 millimeter mm. lens. People buy, I have a 35 millimeter lens I just use for A-roll. Like I just okay. use that for one specific thing. It's an expensive lens I use for one specific thing. So I think for the pro model of camera, you're gonna have people who are actually pros who will want things like that. And a lot of people now, Danny can attest to this, are switching to using their cell phone a lot more for pro content, for content we post on YouTube. Oh, yeah. And so, but this kind of leads me to a, to a question. When are we getting a pro camera app that can really dial in shutter speed and, and things like that, like on the actual iPhone? Because when you go into Final Cut, mm -hmm. you can actually access that information from Final Cut and it imports it to Final Cut, but you just don't have a standalone app 
on your phone that allows you to do those certain things. And then the next question is, when are we getting like official Apple ND filters? I mean, let's take this camera thing to the next level. You know what I mean? Because I feel like we're, we're, we're right there. We have software, but let's get the hardware kind of getting there too. And, and that, that, that's... I feel like you mean that's, like an actual ND, like a hardware ND filter, or or, or, or even software. just or something that screws over the something that screws so over. Hard, I mean, piece yeah, of hardware, yeah, piece yeah. of piece of hardware, or even even built in. That'd be made like a built-in ND. Don't in, put moment out of this guy. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not trying to <laughs> do that. But I feel like there's. I feel like we're getting so close to it. Like we are. We are right there mm-hmm. where the iPhone can definitely be a B camera with with no compromises. Like we are. We are getting so close. Like we have microphones. We have everything ready to go. But it's just a couple of things, like a pro camera app. Mm. Like yeah, but let's start with the software first. Yeah, even pro- just shutter speed. Shutter speed, yeah, for sure. Au- you know, like auto, just just even just doing white balance. I know you can lock the white balance now, but you don't have really any. Yeah, yeah, you have no real control. You have no control over yeah. it. Though. Yeah, yeah. So just we, lock it. I would love just to toggle, even if it's in the settings, you can just yeah. toggle it to a or, pro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'd be neat because I mean, then be there's, apps, there's apps though. There's apps that do this for sure. But, but if you're a pro, you can't you can't afford a quick app. No, no, no. It's, it's not about afford. It's not about affordability. It's about like full support, though. It's yeah. about having it native on the actual device because Apple's going to have more access to that device than those yeah. apps would, right? Yeah. That that's what I'm talking about. Something that can really utilize all the lenses and utilizes all the features because these apps now have to get updated to allow you to do 35 millimeter and just all mm-hmm. these things. Like I would just mm-hmm. want something. This is a pro device. Like let's let's go full in because there's a lot of pro stuff they can do. You know the the whole they're showing the the quick shooting when they're shooting 48 megapixel raw is going straight to the computer, right? Like stuff like that shooting directly to a SSD, mm-hmm. right? Those are very high end pro things, but then we don't have the software for video to really do pro video. Yeah, that bridge is missing. I agree. I yeah. mean, we really need this. I think, but maybe we feel like we really need it because we do use it. Right. I mean, I find myself using the iPhone all the time to to capture content, especially short form. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. nothing like just hand-holding an iPhone and just getting that smooth footage, right? So, Of course. I mean, yeah, I would love to see pro software as well. Yeah, I I would make a a little bit of a counter-argument that everything you said would be useful and make it better, but I forget who it was, but even last week, someone put out a whole music video that was all just shot on iPhone. For sure. And, and you just look, you, you, you couldn't even tell. For sure. Right? So I think we're there. We're, we're at a place where you can shoot your iPhone, your content on an iPhone, put it out to public, and you're no longer in the comments seeing people saying, dude, we'll just shot on a smartphone because this looks terrible. Yeah. Right? That's done. Those yeah. days are over, which is impressive. Yeah, for sure. Right? Like, but. it used to be if you're going on a, on a on a trip like this or you know to to see some content you're taking a heavy camera taking lenses right taking your tripod and these days a lot of those trips that we go on now you can get by with just an iphone i mean let's not lie sometimes you know you just bring out the iphone because the dynamic range is struggling on your camera and then you just bring out the (laughs) iphone you're like dang like this is already this is this is right there so yeah but my my thing is but why not though like why? Oh, I'm not. I'm not against. Yeah, yeah, but, not but, but why not? It. Like why not? Why not? I like it. And and, and also, you don't know what compromises they made to make that music video. Because sometimes, mm. you know, you see someone that has, you know, they have a phone with and they have a rig around it. Yeah. And they have things that they're making adjustments to do that. Like, Little moment lens on there. Yeah, yeah, and and that's super cool, and I'm I'm down for it. But like software, like give us the pro editing software. Like give us, let us dial in our settings. If you don't want to do the hardware, the ND, let us mm-hmm. dial in the settings. Cause are you talking about editing software? No, 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 no. About, I, oh, I mean camera, camera software, like 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 shutter speed and 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 um and white balance and and, and all those things and, and, and ISO, right? I mean those those are yeah. very those are the mm-hmm. very important things when making video. Yeah, and you want the video to look smooth to to not look like a cell phone because to the trained eye, you can still tell when it's a cell phone, especially in a bright a bright area, right? I mean, try to record a helicopter outside, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to see the, the the thing, yeah. you know, it's, it's not going to move because the shutter speed is so high right now to compensate for that, you know? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different things that um, could be different. I'm not complaining, though, because right. I, I love mixing in iPhone footage. Suggestions. And, and yeah, it's just like, let's, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited about what's here, but I'm more excited about what's next. What's to come. Because we're almost there. Like, we're, mm-hmm. we're so close to being there. That's the point I'm getting at. Okay. Speaking of that, Good transition. We were so close, and it's finally here. USB-C. Yes. Got a USB-C port. Sure. Do you care? Are yes. you happy? Very. What do you feel about this? I'm very happy. Um, one less cable I have to bring when I go places, and just like, I just one cable to charge all my things in my life. I mean, you yeah, know. AirPods Max though. 
Okay, that's that's one thing, but I'm sure it's going to get updated with the AirPod, <laughs> AirPod Max too, you know, whatever. <laughs> but it's just like I charge my MacBook with USB C, yeah, and then it's just like I can now just have my backpack of USB C cables, right? Mm-hmm. Like that that can now be my backpack instead of having that. Like, okay, let me grab a couple of lightning. You know, it's just I just like things to be simple and things to be easy and one plug that can do all your Apple stuff that will eventually happen. I think that's amazing, and and, and I'm and I'm all for it, and also. USB-C cables are pretty cheap, and I have like 500 yeah. of them because you buy something and it comes with one, and mm-hmm. you know I don't have to like scramble and find the lightning cable, so I'm very happy. Are you though? Am See, I, what? I, hear, I hear this argument on Twitter all the time. And Am I'm I always what? like, are you though? Am I what though? Like people like, I have to I have to carry two cable. Like really, I have to carry two. I, I two cable. Like really? Yeah. What two? Yeah. Is it, it's not it's not heavy. No, it's, Leave it's, it in your it's bag. Not a, it's not hard to find. It's not, it's not heavy. It's not about. It's not about two. It's a, you. You see, you see my little travel case. I have a I travel it. case. It's, it's nice. I appreciate it. But I have three USB C cables and then three Lightning cables. And for some reason, Lightning cable always goes missing because I end up plugging <laughs> it somewhere or plugging it in my car. I just want to have all all of one cable, and I'll be happy. Mm-hmm. It just it just why why so not? So for you, it's about the port. I just want to have the one cable I for this port. Simpli- I'm about simplicity. Make mm. my life simple, please. That, that that's it. And just one cable, okay. one port. I'm fine. I know there's like faster data transfer speeds. MagSafe. I, you don't care about MagSafe. I do care about MagSafe. MagSafe is fine. MagSafe and, it up. And I have MagSafe at home, mm. but most of the time I don't carry a MagSafe puck with me, right? I carry mm. a charging cable and a brick to mm-hmm. plug it into. Okay. And I can plug my I can plug my phone into it. I can plug my laptop into it. I can plug my freaking gaming. Asus Rogue into it. I can yeah. plug whatever I want into it, and I don't have to worry about, like, oh, let me make sure I got one for my phone, too. I don't have to do that. Okay, Danny, where, where are you thinking on this? Where'd you fall on this? It was about time. We needed it big time, and I think it's just going to make, even for the average consumer, I think it's going to make things easier. Now, the transition is going to be a little tough. Yeah. I can definitely attest to that lightning uh, cable disappearing. I don't know, man. I think there's like a little <laughs> just so yeah. just runs around because yeah. I, I swear I've gone through at least 50 of those cables. Exactly. I don't know what happened. <laughs> But I think, um, you know, it's definitely needed. And I just, the only thing I would say is um, what I would like to have seen is maybe some fast charging that came with this. Mm. Because I I feel like that was a good transition into Mm -hmm. USB-C, at least on the Pro models, right? Because there's a controller there. And I thought maybe that would enable a little bit faster charging. Um, I don't know how you feel about fast charging or not, but uh, it does take a little while to charge the iPhone in comparison to some of the other stuff that's out there. So I would like to see that. Did they not, so the charging did not change at all? I don't think so. No, I I, I looked up the specs online for, for my video. It's the exact same speeds. That was kind of surprising to me because honestly, exact I thought speeds. they would step into yeah, the fast so charging too. thing with this one. Mm-hmm. Say, okay, well, the pro models will get quick charge. Right, you know, so. right. We'll wait till next year. Hey, it's, there's always next year. Yeah, always next year. <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> Gotta have something for next year. <laughs> iPhone iPhone 15 is locked at USB 2 speeds. Yeah. USB 2 is, I believe, um, 17 years old. It's the same speed as what the Lightning is, right? USB 3 is 14 years old, and we got USB 2 on the... So, <laughs> thoughts? I mean, I, most people obviously are not plugging into transfer yeah. data, right? Yeah. And I would assume yeah. the people who, will, who do want to plug into transfer data are likely using Pro phones anyway, and they're getting 10 gigabits USB 3 speeds. Yeah. Um, but I just thought that was funny. Like, I'm surprised. Changing honestly. the port, but yeah. we're keeping it USB 2 speeds. It, it seemed like um, it would be easier from a perspective of supply chain and things like that to just have one port. But I guess, you know, it's a, probably about cost. Honestly. Yeah, m- maybe. Um, so USB 3 speeds, though, on the Pro phone. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting there is A17 Pro. Yes. A17 Pro, right? Which to me means we're getting two lines of mobile chips now. Next year the iPhone 16 is not going to get an A17 Pro chip because that would give it USB 3 speeds because that's where that's where the controller is. Uh-huh. So we're going to see an A17 non-Pro and an A18 Pro next year. This is I'm, I'm they didn't tell me this of course. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah. I'm speculating here. There's a Pro chip now and a non-Pro chip. Much much faster, much more enhanced GPU. And it's 3 nanometers now. 3 nanometers. Um but that GPU update is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to see some Resident Evil Village up close, and I was just like Dude, blown this is, away. This is absolutely yeah. exciting yeah. for yeah. what the gaming market has been like. Mm-hmm. Because 
it's kind of like the you think about mobile gaming and it's all the pay to play yep. like you know that kind of stuff the stuff that my kids are into yes that kind of stuff but now if you're bringing console level games i'm not sure what kind of magic uh, apple wizardry they're going to be doing with the you know the metal stuff and everything mm -hmm. else but it's just this is very exciting for the market because for you to be able to play console level stuff on your iphone and it actually be the console version yep. is that's awesome yeah and i confirm i, I was like listen Resident Evil, is this, is anything about this like mobile optimized, mobile assets, mo and they were like, no, this is the same assets you would get on a console or a desktop. Same. Yeah. There's no difference here, and you can see it running right here on the phone. I'm assuming they're doing 720p upscaling or some kind of magic to make that happen. That didn't say, I know there's metal effects yeah. happening there, but, you know, when you use metal on an M2, not even an M2 Pro, non, you know, you can get almost to max settings if you're playing a game on like a MacBook, uh, MacBook Air, um, which kind of makes me excited to see because all the M series chips are based on the A series chips, right? Yeah. So that means we're going to see these GPUs in future MacBooks, Mac Studio, whatever it might be. Essentially, you know, Apple's been trying to, to talk about gaming at their last few events, yeah. right? But people in... You know, consumers are always just kind of looking at it like, yeah. what are you yeah. talking about? I, can, I can't game on a Mac. I can, I can talk to Mac gaming for a while because I was actually working on a video about trying to game on a Mac. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a big gamer. I, I, still, mm -hmm. I still game as much as I can. I, I love gaming, yeah. right? So the hardware for gaming on a Mac is great. But the thing is, these games have to be optimized yeah. in such a way that developers would have to do this. Mm -hmm. And the problem is not that many developers are they're still not doing it because it's, it's the whole you know the, uh the, the chicken or the egg type of thing right yeah it's like you know a developer's like i'm not spending time and resources developing a game for such little amount of people which makes sense and these little amount of people was like i want more games so it's this whole thing like someone has to break right yeah. there, there has to be a slew of developers saying all right we're gonna do it mm -hmm. but the thing is like they use resident evil village as an example all the time, we talked about this, they use them as an example all the time because it's the perfectly optimized game. They followed all the proper protocols and it scales great. MacBook Air, you could play it, it works great. Mm -hmm. Put on a MacBook Pro, it looks amazing. Put on a Mac Studio, the game will blow you away. One of the best looking games. HDR is crazy, like everything about it's crazy. So that's why it works so well on mm -hmm. mobile. But the thing is, without those developers, you're not gonna really utilize that Apple gaming on the phone as we're seeing in these demos though. Yeah. Now, I could be wrong. There could be a whole slew of developers ready to go, but from my experience, the last year and a half trying to game on a Mac, it, I ran into that. Where it's just these, there's a big wiki too that explains like perfectly optimized mm. games, and it's such a small percentage of games that works for Mac versus perfectly optimized, where you have a perfect experience depending on the hardware that you have. So it's just one of those things that it's a it's a struggle. Yeah, I'm sure it's a struggle trying to get developers on board to do I'm this sure. when they only have you know a small fraction of gamers who are not buying a macbook pro to game on right they're they're, mm -hmm. they're not buying that or you know they're they're, they're going xbox or whatever or they have a gaming pc so yeah. that's that, that's that's my concern i love the hardware I, I love what it can do i'm excited about the games but i don't think there's gonna be a ton of games that that would really utilize that that will blow you away well what's what's interesting here i think is you mentioned like the mac and the gaming community on a mac are so small right yeah which makes sense if these games are gonna to come to the iPhone, which has a huge user base, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then can go up from the iPhone instead. So you, you, they talked about um, the next Assassin's Creed. It's not even out yet. Yeah, It's gonna be there, again, full console assets. It's not a mobile version at all. So my, my understanding was that Assassin's Creed was one that came out a couple years ago. No, I, I think it was the original yeah. Assassin's Creed. So yeah, my understanding of this is an older Assassin's Creed that was a console version that's coming to no. to mobile. No? no, it is the okay. next Assassin's Creed that's not even out yet. Okay, it's not even on console yet. All right, I misunderstood. So that, that next then. Assassin's Creed that's not out yet will also be coming to the iPhone. The exact game. The exact same, game. The same right. game. Right. Which means it's going to run on Apple Silicon Max because it's running on the iPhone. Right. This is the motivation for developers. Yes. So because now the, the motivation is sales. if you can do it for the iPhone, okay. then you can just put it on. The, now it's ready for the Mac, right? Very, very yeah. little changes need to be made. Okay. Um, and that could be what actually is the impetus to seeing more of these games come to the Mac. 
I hope so. Maybe. I hope so because I have a gaming PC right now that I that I use, and I would love to just have one one piece of computer hardware and do all my work and gaming on one spot. But I have a gaming PC that I just use for like two games. <laughs> what games are you playing? Halo. I'm not playing Halo with you, Neve. What? <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing Warzone. <laughs> okay. Playing a lot of Warzone. I'm playing a little Starfield right now. Ah, you do. You got into it a little bit. You got into it. I'm running around space. I don't know what's happening. I okay. forget. I forget a lot, but I'm running around. Okay. It's okay. okay. It's okay. It's not bad. Danny, you get into Starfield at all? No. Come on, man. No, I can't, don't, man. Don't do it, Danny. I just can't. Oh, I can't get you into. Got it. to. Don't do it, Danny. I got to keep my gaming to a very small, I, minimal level. Man. I remember you used to come to play Call of Duty with us, and you end up just chatting for three hours. Right. Like, <laughs> like, 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 I can't get into like you never got in the game. You just would chat with us. Yeah, like, Danny, this is, not, this is not war zone chat. This is not war zone <laughs> therapy, bro. It's like, get on here, man. We got to get like, some dubs. What's your gaming, Danny? What's your gaming looking like? Gaming is just very limited for me, man. So I try to try out some of the newer stuff that comes out, uh, you know, just testing some hardware and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, I mean, I try to play a little bit of Baldur's Gate 3. Um, but, like, you know, once I'm in a game for, like, three hours and then I'm realizing, man, you know, there's, like, kids running around and doing all this yep. stuff. I'm like, man, I got to get off this and and go and, you know, edit some video or something. So oh. it's just like I, I, I love it because I feel like it is therapeutic, though. Yeah. It sure. is like sure. you can kind of like escape and do that, but it's like it does take up a lot of timing, especially if oh, you for want sure. to get good or if yeah. you actually do things with it. So mm -hmm. I try to limit that just because. I got you. I got the, you. I hear you. The problem is Drew wants to play the same. Well, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Drew wants to play Halo. No one's playing Halo anymore. So I feel They're like playing I, Halo Infinite. All right, fine. Let me get on Halo with Drew. Come on, man. Let me get on Halo with Drew. I don't. Fortnite. Don't little it. Fortnite. Nah. Nope. <laughs> no. She, she got me on Fortnite every night. <laughs> Fortnite all the time. Um. Before we get back, uh, Starfield. Yeah. How, how many hours have you been playing? I've put in probably, not, not a ton of time, maybe maybe four and a half hours. Okay. Four and a half hours in, 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 in a Decent. week or two weeks. Decent. I mean, but, but, but the first two hours you're going through a tutorial, so I you, know. Don't, you don't have a lot of choice. I'm like designing my character like I'm playing The Sims again <laughs> and like making myself like being like very you? specific. You look like you though? I was working on it. I had a picture of myself taped to my monitor, like really trying to... <laughs> I'm not joking. Bro, no, no, no. I had I was I was on my couch and I was taking selfies of myself from the side. Yeah, and I was like, to, okay, let me see how, what kind of nose do I got? I was trying to I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, like a, what are you guys doing? I'm like yeah. a ten nose. I'm like ten. <laughs> nose ten. <laughs> well it's no Starfield though, you literally like when you hit fifteen hours, it's like a totally different game. Okay, I'm looking forward like, to it. Like it's that. crazy, it's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like because you think you're okay, I got it. Ten hours in and then fifteen hours in it's like wait a minute. Hmm. I just already put me off to so, 15 hours. Oh, it's fun, get, though. Come on. Oh, okay. Uh, let's close this out with um, iPhone uh, iPhone 15 Pro. So let's talk about camera. We talked about it a little bit already. Um, but let's talk about camera and then action button. Action button, yeah. Action button. Sure. Start with camera. I want to hear you guys' take on this camera. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing they mentioned that they kind of glossed over was that uh, the lenses has different coating on it. Yes. So it doesn't affect like lens flare. Because remember a couple years ago, that they said green, little, little green, the little green, green dots. What the green heck dots. was that? So I, I'm down to try out less lens flare because when you, when you used to go to ultra wide, any type of sun would like dart, dart in the mm. shot from the top. You know what I'm talking about. It would dart yep. to the top from the top And the corner. reflections too. Yeah. Man. So, so mm. hopefully, you know. They they've listened to reviews and they they changed the coding which should be a lot better. I'm excited about that. Um, 5x zoom I, I like because there's been situations where I wanted more zoom. Like I went to the zoo recently and doing more stuff with my kid and, and all that stuff. And like when I have my phone out, he sees I have my phone out. Yep. And getting him in different activities and stuff. And then when I have my phone out, he sees it. So it's been a snap a photo a little further away and just yep. doing more things and just having more flexibility in my pocket is kind of what I want. Um, and also video gets better. I mean, I, I love video already. I, we talked about it already, but just having that stabilization that's a lot better is something I'm looking forward to uh, with the camera. So I'm very happy about it. And also portrait mode. They talked about skin tones and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited yes. to I'm excited to really dig into the portrait mode because I think a lot of the competition has caught up mm -hmm. when it comes to portrait pictures. So yeah. I'm ready to yeah. see what um, like iPhone's response to the competition catching up. In my mm -hmm. opinion, mm -hmm. Danny. Yeah. Um, yeah, the cameras, man, you know, I'm always looking forward to that. I think it just pretty much doubling up what he said with the, with the cameras. Um, it's just I, I, I still find it a little hard that it's not on the pro model, mm -hmm. you know, the, the 5X zoom. But, right. yeah, I think that, you know, the portrait mode is, is really cool or the just not, not even thinking about it. I just think about my wife when she takes pictures. She's not going to, like, f swap into yeah. portrait mode. So I love the fact that now you can take all those shots and you can just change it to portrait yep. mode later. 
I would really love to see that come to video one day where you just mm. shoot the video and then if you want it to be cinematic mode, you can just flip a switch. Mm. That would be super that would tight. Be very nice. Mm. That would That'd be, be very nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would be really cool. But I mean, you know, hey, baby steps. But yeah, I think uh, I can't wait to test the cameras, man. That's that's the biggest thing. I want to see how how much better it is than the last generation because I, I think that's when you can really get the picture yeah of of how many improvements are actually being made right and especially i mean you know most people are upgrading every year so how how much better is it than iphone 12 or 13 as oh, well right true. because that'll be a really nice upgrade for a lot of people um let's close it out with the action button that was actually my my favorite thing that i saw was it because for me it feels like it's that is something that like people talk about all the time android customized custom customization right like yeah. i want to make this phone mine and this is a hardware button that lets you make it yours right not just through whether you want to keep it as a mute switch or having it open your camera and when and you have like sub sub menus as well like you might want it to open selfie camera and i might want it to open the video camera right and yeah we could both do that but then you got shortcuts in there I think that's the big one. That's, yeah, that's huge. Sure. That, 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 opens the, that opens the yeah. door, right? That opens the door. I'm wondering, depending on your focus mode, can you change the action button to do different things? Like, let's say I have a focus mode called, you know, at home, or I have one called at work or playing golf. And, mm -hmm. you know, each focus mode does different. I mean, uh, each action button does different when you're in different focus mode. You cannot do that. You can only use it to turn on or off that focus. But within that focus, you can say, here's what my, I want my focus to be. Yeah. So, for example, one thing you could do is, like, when I'm in this focus mode, I want my phone muted. No, for sure. But now yeah. you don't need a mute switch. No, because I, I, I agree. Yeah. Software mute. I agree. But it can't, it can't do that. But one area where it does is if you use it as your camera opener, then it acts as a shutter button. Shutter button, yeah. But only cool. if it's for your camera. Yeah. Because otherwise, if you use it to mute and then you're in camera, you're going to just be unmuting yeah. your phone, right? I, I agree, yeah. So. I think this is just the beginning of it. I'm, I'm sure it's going to expand a little bit later. Last question. What are, you, what are you setting your action button to? I don't know yet. I was thinking about that. Probably flashlight. I use the flashlight a ton. I use the flashlight a lot. That's like a senior citizen. That I, is I the know, last I know. thing I expect I, I'm, you to say. It's on the lock screen. It's right there. But, but the phone's not locked. I mean, I drop stuff a lot. And also, like, <laughs> restaurant menus, man, they're so difficult at the freaking... They got I a magnifier. Magnifier's no, an I, option I don't, for you. I don't need the just, magnifier. Just, just blow it up. Dude, That's I, why he needs a zoom. I'm at, why. I'm at Cheesecake Factory struggling, man. Just like... back zoom into that menu. <laughs> Danny, what are, you, what are you doing? Shortcutting? I think I'm going to do some shortcuts. Probably some smart home, smart home stuff. Yeah, I think it'll be neat for that. Um, even just car stuff would be cool, too, mm, as well. That's true. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you can... Tie it into your Tesla. Yeah. Or, yep. Okay. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm going to primarily use it as the camera opener. But you, you just gave me. A, I mean, I want to see flashlight. No, no. Oh, okay. If if I'm in <laughs> if I'm in the home focus, can it be a smart home button? That's and what if I'm, I'm saying. If I'm in a work focus, can it? That that's kind of interesting. That's so we're gonna find out about that's that. That's what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks thanks for joining me this week. Yeah, thanks, yeah for course. Thanks special, for having me. Special man. here from yeah. Apple Park. Um, let people know where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me uh, pretty much anywhere, Tech Ninja Speaks, or on YouTube, uh, Kevin the Tech Ninja. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, I have to say that I am matching this couch with my... Uh, you are. My you shacket are, is man. matching the couch. Perfectly. So, th Perfect. Thank you. Thing in. Love it. Yeah, just Danny Winjet, as super scientific everywhere. Right. If you want to know about the, these cameras on these phones, just check Danny on YouTube. Appreciate it. Kevin does some too, though. Don't, don't disrespect. He does. He, uh, no, no disrespect, but we know. <laughs> we, know. We, know, we, know, we know. We know Danny's bread and butter. <laughs> Sorry. Do you ever get that exciting new iPhone in your hands? peel off the plastic, turn it on for the very first time, and then have to stare at transfer progress bars for hours before you can actually use it. I know I do, and it is the worst. But not anymore, my friends. The iPhone 15 Pro has a trick up its sleeve that let me set up my new iPhone faster than ever before. I'm talking fully loaded and ready to rock in just over two hours. Now that might sound like a long time to you, but when I first set up my iPhone 15 Pro, the process took over 24 hours at first. Now you're probably thinking, how is this even possible? Well, I use a one terabyte iPhone 15 Pro because I have a lot of data. In fact, right now I have 393 gigabytes available, which means I'm using just over 600 gigs of storage on this 15 Pro. So for me, a full wireless iCloud restore takes a 
full day unless I am on a fast Wi-Fi connection. Now, of course I was not because I was on hotel Wi-Fi in Cupertino. If you've ever stayed in a hotel, you know what that means. So what sort of black magic am I talking about? In the past, I always did my iPhone restorations in one of two ways. Like I said, either an iCloud restore, which takes like six to eight hours typically when I'm not in a hotel, as it re-downloads all of your apps and data and everything else that you had on your previous phone. Or the direct iPhone to iPhone wireless transfer, which is a little faster at around four to six hours for me, but still I consider that pretty much an all day process. Neither option is quick. There's a lot of sitting around, watching progress bars slowly creep along. To switch from my iPhone 14 Pro Max over to the 15 Pro Max, I opted for the iCloud Restore just so I could get things up and running while everything downloaded in the background. And as I said, it took me over 24 hours before everything was actually done restoring because I was at the hotel, I was on the go, I was on 5G, I was on 4G, back on hotel Wi-Fi. Now, of course, at least I could use the phone while things were downloading in the background, but a lot of my apps were missing data until everything was done. Alternatively, I could have went with the faster wireless direct transfer, but in that case, you can't use the phone at all until that transfer is done. So at least with the iCloud Restore, after about 15 minutes, I can go about my business and just let things download as they happen in the background. Now, as you likely have heard by now, Apple has made the switch to USB-C ports on the iPhone 15 devices this year, and the Pro models in particular get super fast connection speeds, and this changes everything. With the fast 10 gigabits per second speeds of USB 3.2 Gen 2, I decided to take the iPhone 15 Pro Max that I already restored and use this to restore it to an iPhone 15 Pro, non-Max. I wanted to see how much faster it would be if I did a direct connection. Now, the first time I did it, I messed up. I was expecting the restore process to instruct me to plug the phones into each other at some point if I wanted, but that never happened. So I went through the wireless direct restore, which took about five and a half hours to complete. Now that was actually faster than normal, and I'm attributing that to the fact that the new models have Wi-Fi 6E, so they can transfer data faster than the older models. But I really wanted to try and see if a wired connection would even work. So I completely erased the iPhone 15 Pro and tried it a second time. Now this time I started by plugging the phones into each other and as you can see, once I got to the transfer screen, it recognized that they were plugged in right in the setup process. From there, I let the magic happen. I set up an iPhone 15 Plus and used it as a timer so that we could see just how long it would take. Now for reference, I would be transferring about 450 gigs or so of data over, not that full 600 gigs because things like your apps, cache data, and duplicate files don't get transferred over, those get downloaded after the fact. But as you can see, my suspicions were correct. I was able to connect my iPhone 15 Pro directly to the iPhone 15 Pro Max with a USB-C to USB-C cable, and the entire transfer process, start to finish, just took two hours and 20 minutes. That's over four times faster than the wireless restore on the older wireless speeds on the 14 and older, and three times faster than using the 15 Pro's Wi-Fi 6E wireless connection. And when it comes to the iCloud restore, this ended up being 12 times faster than what I experienced a couple of weeks ago. Now, again, I know I have way more data on my iPhone than a lot of people, but Apple does sell one terabyte models for a reason, so there are definitely people out there who will benefit. But hey, if you only have 80 or 100 gigabytes of data on your iPhone, this helps you too. Imagine restoring a backup in just a couple of minutes. Now, why is it so much faster? The key difference is that new USB-C port and its support for USB 3.2 transfer speeds. We're talking up to 10 gigabits per second fast. That's 20 times faster than the old 480 megabits per second max speed of a lightning cable. And again, the iPhone 15 Pro has the new Wi-Fi 6E standard, so wireless file transfers can now hit peak speeds up to two times faster when connecting to other Wi-Fi 6E devices. But still, neither of those can match the blazing fast 10 gigs per second speeds of a direct wired USB-C connection for transferring your photos, videos, apps, and settings 
to a new iPhone. You'll be able to do this starting next year. The reason I said that is because I imagine most people are not upgrading from an iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max to another iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max like I did here. If you're upgrading from an iPhone 14 or older, you don't have Wi-Fi 6E for that fast wireless connection, and you certainly don't have a 10 gigabit USB-C port either. So for this year's upgrades, when you're restoring from a backup, you're still gonna be going at those slower speeds unless you back up your current phone to a computer and then use a USB-C cable to restore from that backup stored on your computer to your new iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max. This is the future of fast iPhone setups. No more staring at the progress bar all day. Just plug in USB-C and your new iPhone Pro is ready to rock in no time. In the world of smartphones, two heavyweights stand above the rest, the iPhone and Galaxy S series. Apple and Samsung continually strive to one-up each other with their latest flagship releases. In 2023, the competition is as fierce as ever between the new iPhone 15 Pro Max and Samsung's Galaxy S23 Ultra. Both phones bring incredible power and innovation. I'll be comparing the key features and capabilities of these two smartphone titans with breakdowns of their designs, displays, performance, cameras, and other important factors. Speaking of which, let's get started with design. This year on the Pro line of iPhones, we are getting an all new titanium design. That's right, stainless steel has been retired and in its place is an aerospace grade titanium alloy that frames the sides of the iPhone 15 Pro devices. This creates the most durable iPhone build yet while keeping them incredibly lightweight. Seriously, these phones feel so much lighter in the hand, which was my main complaint about the iPhone 12, 13, and 14 Pro devices. The titanium alloy also allows the border widths to be shrunk down, so we also have the thinnest bezels ever on an iPhone. I know a lot of people are obsessed with bezels and will be super happy to hear this, so there you have it. Apple then used those smaller bezels to shrink down the dimensions of the phone instead of keeping them the same and making the screen a little bit larger. And again, I think that was the right move because this phone is much easier to hold in the hand. But it's not just about aesthetics. The internal redesign also utilizes 100% recycled aluminum for improved repairability. So you get a more sustainable iPhone that's easier to repair. Now, when it comes to the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, there are a few things you notice right away. The cameras on the back are even bigger this time around when compared to the Galaxy S22 Ultra, and the display is flatter. There's still a gentle curve on the 6.8 inch panel, but you get a slimmer curve with a flatter surface area, which makes using an S Pen a bit more comfortable. I'm one of those people who would always prefer a flat display, as I'm not a fan of the phantom touches on the sides of the phone when using it, or the sometimes difficult method of selecting text or a button that just happens to be located along the curve. Now, like the iPhone 15 Pro Max, the Galaxy S23 Ultra is also built for longevity. It was the first phone with Corning's Gorilla Glass Victus 2, which promised to protect the front and back better from scratches and drops. Both phones offer IP68 water and dust resistance, but the iPhone 15 Pro Max can go to depths of six meters for 30 minutes, while the S23 Ultra can only go to 1.5 meters for 30 minutes. Now, in terms of unique features, the Galaxy S23 Ultra obviously supports the S Pen. I know that stylus input is very important to a section of users out there, and if that's you, you just won't find a similar experience like this on the iPhone. What you will find though is the highly customizable action button which replaces the mute switch. Now I did a video on this specific feature which I will link below, but there is way more power in this one button than you might realize thanks to the shortcuts integration. I'm planning another dedicated video on how you can supercharge your action button by using shortcuts, so be on the lookout for that one soon. Okay, next, let's talk performance. The iPhone 15 Pro Max is all about the new A17 Pro chip. It's a whole new architecture built on a three nanometer process with improvements to the CPU, GPU, and neural engine. The six core CPU is up to 10% faster thanks to these architectural improvements. That makes it the fastest CPU in any smartphone and rivals speeds found in desktop PCs. But the real news is the all new six core GPU. 
It introduces a totally redesigned architecture that amplifies graphics and gaming capabilities to never before seen levels in a smartphone. Demands of professional workflows like ProRes video and the new 48 megapixel camera output are easily met with dedicated imaging and video pipelines. And bleeding edge gaming features like ray tracing create console quality visuals on an iPhone for the first time. I'll have a dedicated video coming on that as well, but let me just say that playing Resident Evil Village on a smartphone at this quality was insane. I can't wait to see how other games like Death Stranding and Assassin's Creed Mirage look with the power of the A17 Pro behind them. The Galaxy S23 Ultra, on the other hand, is using a custom version of Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 platform called the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 for Galaxy. The main difference is an accelerated CPU with up to 3.36 gigahertz speeds alongside an upgraded GPU that has faster performance and increased power efficiency. It also provides for real-time hardware accelerated ray tracing to bring lifelike light, reflections, and illuminations in mobile games, but that is the key difference, I think. The iPhone's A17 Pro is looking to bring console games into the mobile space rather than just optimizing for mobile games, which is something that the Snapdragon isn't capable of doing just yet. Both devices start at 256 gigabytes of storage with eight gigabytes of RAM, but the Galaxy S23 Ultra does offer 12 gigabytes of RAM at the top end. Apple also uses NVMe storage, which is faster than the Galaxy's UFS 4.0 storage with lower latency to boot. Okay, next, let's talk about these displays. At 6.8 inches, the S23 Ultra is slightly larger than the 6.7 inch iPhone 15 Pro Max. It makes use of a dynamic AMOLED panel with a sharp 3200 by 1440 resolution and an adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate. This produces incredibly vibrant images and graphics. By comparison, the iPhone sports a Super Retina XTR OLED display also with an adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate and a 2796 by 1290 resolution. However, it leverages Apple's optimization between software and hardware for excellent color accuracy. Now, side by side, the S23 Ultra reveals stronger contrast for deep blacks and vivid highlights, while the 15 Pro Max can get over 500 nits brighter, maxing out at just above 2000 nits. This boost comes in handy under bright sunlight. Another visual difference between the two displays is obviously that small hole punch camera cutout on the S23 Ultra versus the dynamic island on the iPhone 15 Pro Max. And I've got to say, Apple's done well to market the dynamic island and this year with support for live actions, it really becomes useful, like being able to track your Uber Eats orders or control your music and podcasts or monitor your flights with my favorite dynamic island app, Flighty not sponsored. It's the most Apple-y way of obfuscating the camera hole by turning it into a feature of the phone. Ultimately, both deliver excellent displays, so the ideal display depends on your personal preferences for size, resolution, and peak brightness. Next, let's talk about the cameras. Built into the camera app in the iPhone are seven different focal lengths through computational photography making the camera super versatile. I've seen a few people online saying that you are getting seven different lenses, but that's not the case. You still have three lenses back here, but you can choose a 1.2X and 1.5X focal lengths for 28 and 35 millimeter equivalents, respectively, on top of the 24 millimeter. The main 48 megapixel camera now captures even finer details at a crisp 24 megapixel resolution by default by taking a binned 12 megapixel image with the larger quad pixels for great low light and detail and combining it with the full 48 megapixel image with individual pixels so it picks up all the detail. Apple's photonic engine then goes to work applying deep fusion, smart HDR and the entire image pipeline to give you excellent 24 megapixel photos. And that's with zero shutter lag, which is more than I can say for just about any other phone on the market. Another big one in the camera this year for the iPhone is the 48 megapixel HEIF. This allows you to take a full 48 megapixel image at a tremendously smaller file size, about five megabytes versus 75 megabytes when shooting a 48 megapixel shot in Pro Raw. Of course, videos taken on the iPhone 15 Pro continue to be industry leading as it pertains to quality as well. Whether you're using the camera for photos or video, you're gonna come away happy with the results. 
Now the iPhone 15 Pro Max also boasts the biggest innovation across this year's iPhones, and that's the Tetra Prism design, which enables a telephoto lens that achieves a 5X optical zoom, giving you a 120 millimeter focal length with an f2.8 aperture, enabling great close-ups. Paired with a new 3D sensor shift image stabilization technology, even shots at full zoom stay crisp and steady as the sensor shift module moves in all three directions for the first time on any smartphone. This provides up to 10,000 micro adjustments per second, which is twice as many as the iPhone 14 Pro Max. Also for the first time, the Pro Camera system on the iPhone meets the demands of professional filmmakers. Capturing log-encoded ProRes video to external SSD drives enables cinema-grade post-production workflows without having to eat into your iPhone's storage. Meanwhile, over on the Galaxy S23 Ultra, the main rear camera boasts a wide 200 megapixel sensor with optical image stabilization, laser autofocus, and an f1.7 aperture. This allows for ultra fine resolution, millions of colors, and the ability to print photos into canvas size images. Now, additionally, the Super Quad Pixel technology provides enhanced autofocus by having more points of reference. The camera also features Nightography, a pro-grade night photography mode that captures bigger and more detailed shots in low light. The ultra-wide camera is a 12 megapixel sensor with an f2.2 aperture, and the zoom camera features 3x and 10x optical zoom and 100x space zoom. The S23 Ultra also includes a new night portrait mode on the front-facing camera, which uses AI to analyze things like glasses and hair that portrait modes typically struggle with resulting in a nicely blurred background effect. Super HDR is also applied on the front camera for more dynamic range. The Galaxy S23 Ultra also features an expert RAW mode, which gives users access to the uncompressed data from the image. This allows for more flexibility in post-processing and editing as the full range of color and detail is preserved. Another feature of the S23 Ultra's camera is astrophoto mode, which is specifically designed for capturing night sky photos. This mode uses multiple exposures and advanced image processing to produce clear and detailed shots of stars and galaxies. Next, let's talk battery life. The Galaxy S23 Ultra has a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, which does a great job at getting you through the day, or at least that's what I found over the past eight months or so. It's a really solid battery that you rarely need to worry about. With the iPhone 15 Pro Max being newer, I haven't had the same amount of time to test it out and get used to it. But what I can say is that it's a welcome change from the 14 Pro Max, which I regularly felt like would hit me with a low battery notification in the late afternoon. The iPhone 15 Pro Max has a 4,422 milliamp hour battery, but with iOS 17 optimizations and the newer three nanometer A17 Pro processor, the efficiency gains could end up helping out iPhone owners tremendously this time around. Both phones offer USB-C connectivity, which is the first time we've ever been able to say that, but you're still stuck with relatively slower 29 watt charging speeds on the iPhone, while the S23 Ultra charges at up to 45 watts. Neither includes a fast charger in the box, so you have to grab one on your own if you don't already have one. Wireless charging is also faster on the Samsung device at up to 25 watts, while the iPhone can do wireless MagSafe and Qi 2 charging at up to 15 watts, or Qi charging at 7.5 watts. Now, those are the major categories I think people who are truly on the fence are gonna wanna consider. The biggest variable though is gonna be if you prefer using iOS or Android. In that case, then the decision has kind of already been made for you, unless you're willing to switch. All right, we just got the fastest Apple event in history, just 30 minutes of runtime. And in that time, Apple announced three new chips, three new computers, and if that wasn't enough, an incredible flex at the very end. I attended the event in person and was able to get my hands on everything afterwards. So let's talk about it. Just 10 months after the release of M2 Pro and M2 Max MacBook Pros, we now have the arrival of the M3 fam. So what does that mean? It means even faster MacBook Pros rocking the new M3, M3 Pro, and M3 Max. Now, as you'd expect, these chips are even faster and more efficient than before, about 15% faster than the ones released literally earlier this year, and 30 to 50% faster than the M1 from about 18 months ago. So the gains that we're seeing in that time are huge. 
In addition to offering a faster and more efficient CPU, the chips also get an updated GPU, which supports ray tracing and mesh shading, two modern and essential components for running AAA games. They also have a new feature called dynamic caching, which greatly optimizes the amount of memory the device uses during tasks, letting the system use the max amount of GPU power at any given time. Now, both laptops, the 14 and 16 inch versions, feature a mini LED display that's 20% brighter than before, the 1080p camera, six speaker sound system, an incredible 22 hours of battery life, and up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. They're also available in a new space black finish with a new coating that's supposed to help reduce fingerprints as well as the silver option. Now, in my personal opinion, it's not as dark as I was hoping it would be, but it's definitely darker than space gray. Maybe they should have called it dark gray, but I digress. Now, as I just said, Apple's M3 Max chips offer up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory, with the most powerful M3 Max chip coming with up to 92 billion transistors, a 40 core GPU, and a 16 core CPU. And by the way, this is the first time in history that you can buy an Apple laptop with 128 gigabytes of RAM. That's just insane. So that's the first thing. Second, when it comes to the new M3 lineup, I saw a lot of people on Twitter and on threads wondering why Apple kept comparing it to the M1 and and Intel chips instead of a direct comparison from the M2 to the M3. So let's just talk about that real quick. The consensus that I saw was that the M3 must not be that much of an improvement over the M2 because why is Apple comparing it to the M1 and older Intel chips? Now remember, these Apple events, these are marketing events. These are events made to sell products. So I personally think that's a pretty lazy take that the M3 isn't that much better than the M2 and that's why Apple didn't compare them. Because again, the M3 is about 15% faster than the M2 that came out just 10 months ago. That's a pretty big jump in 10 months time. So I think just taking a second and thinking about things reveals the real answer. Unlike other chip makers like Qualcomm, Intel, and AMD, Apple doesn't need to sell chips to PC vendors. Vendors. The others do. When they're a new chip, they need to hype it up and compare it to the last chip because they need to convince Dell, Lenovo, Acer, Asus, PC vendors to buy these chips and put them into their systems. Apple makes chips for themselves, for their computers, and Apple sells computers to their customers. M2 owners who bought a new computer in the past two days to 10 months are likely not the ones who are going to be buying a replacement laptop for the one they literally just purchased. So instead, Apple was verbally speaking to the customers who are much more likely to upgrade. That's customers on M1 or earlier. M3 Max is up to 80% faster than M1 Max. While also including M2 stats visually on the slides as they were talking. The vast majority of iMac owners in particular still own an Intel model, but more on that in a moment. Third, I mentioned the new MacBook Pros rock the M3, M3 Pro, and M3 Max chips. But previously, the 14 and 16 inch models only used the Pro and the Max version. The regular M1 and M2 were relegated to the MacBook Air and the older, outdated 13 inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar. Well, now that the 14 inch MacBook Pro also comes in the generic M3 variety, Apple has finally removed the Touch Bar MacBook Pro from the lineup after seven years. It's gone. So if you just need the M3 but want something better than the Mac, MacBook Air, you can get the modern 14 inch MacBook Pro instead of having to buy the outdated design. However, the new space black color is not available in that entry level model, where instead you'll choose between silver or space gray. Oh, and you get two Thunderbolt 3 ports instead of three Thunderbolt 4 ports, the difference being that Thunderbolt 4 supports multiple external displays, while Thunderbolt 3 only supports one. Fourth on the list, there is a new 24 inch iMac, but not much has changed here at all. In fact, when looking at the hardware, it seems that Apple just took the previous M1 iMac, removed the M1 chip and replaced it with the M3 and called it a day. We're getting the same seven colors that we had before and even the same magic mouse, magic keyboard and magic trackpad that charge with a lightning cable instead of USB-C. Now that's interesting to me because if we go another 18 months or so without an iMac refresh, then 
this might mean that Apple is going to be selling Lightning accessories for that long too. That said, if the iMac is your jam, the jump from M1 to M3 is fantastic and you're getting a much better computer for it. Okay, fifth, this is the one that changed the whole event for me. When it was over and Tim Cook bid us good night, Apple put its biggest flex of the night up on the screen. It wasn't any of the M3 chips, it wasn't the MacBook Pros, it definitely wasn't the iMac. It was the fact that this beautiful, high production value, 30 minute Apple event was entirely shot on iPhone and edited on Mac. They shot the entire event, start to finish on the iPhone 15 Pro instead of the $100,000 Arri cameras that they normally use. The same phone that you may very well have in your pocket right now or may be watching this video on is the same one they used to record the entire event. They even released a behind the scenes video showing how they did this. They attached the iPhone 15 Pros to drones and cranes just like they would any other cinema camera and the end result was an event that was indistinguishable from all the other ones where they use cameras that cost a hundred times more than the iPhone 15 Pro. So when it comes to video, you've got a lot of power in this device right here. This is Apple's new MacBook Pro powered by the M3 Max chip and it presents a very interesting dilemma if you will, for Apple. Let me explain. With the M1 and M2 chips already delivering such massive leaps in performance, efficiency, and capability, these Apple Silicon Macs may have reached a level where most users hold on to them significantly longer compared to the Intel models before feeling the need to upgrade. All that said, the M3 Max MacBook Pro is here, so let's open this up and talk about it. The new MacBook Pro comes packaged in the typical cardboard box, but no longer wrapped in plastic. Instead, you just pull the tabs and you're in. Lifting the it reveals the MacBook Pro wrapped in a protective paper sleeve. And under that, we find the braided USB-C to MagSafe cable, which allows for high-speed charging at up to 50% battery in just 30 minutes when paired with the included 140-watt USB-C power adapter. There are also the usual manuals, warranty, and regulatory documents, and Apple stickers in black to match the new space black finish. Speaking of which, peeling the paper off the MacBook Pro reveals the new space black finish. It has an understated, almost stealth-like aesthetic meant to give off the vibe of sophisticated power. I think it looks really good. Now, let's dive deeper into the features of this machine, starting with the display. If you haven't yet owned a 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro powered by Apple Silicon, these displays are incredible. Here we have a 16 inch Liquid Retina XDR display, and it's hands down the best laptop screen that I've ever used. It starts with searing brightness up to 60 1600 nits peak and a thousand nits sustained for HDR content. So shadows look dramatically darker while highlights like flickering flames and glints of sunlight take on an almost lifelike luminosity. This transformational dynamic range is achieved through a cutting edge direct backlighting system with over 10,000 mini LEDs grouped into nearly 2,600 local dimming zones. Sophisticated algorithms modulate the LEDs in real time to optimize the image. Now for SDR content, you're getting 600 nits, which is 20 percent brighter than the previous model. The display also delivers gorgeous color thanks to the wide P3 gamut and support for 1 billion colors. Scrolling and motion look silky smooth thanks to the Pro Motion tech, allowing the screen to dynamically adjust from 10 hertz all the way up to 120 hertz refresh rates depending on the content you're watching or working on. And then there's the design, which balances power with portability. It retains the solid unibody aluminum chassis, but Apple Silicon models have refined details like the flattened top and the relocated vents. And as I mentioned earlier, Apple has also introduced this new darker finish this time, Space Black. Obviously it's purely aesthetic, but the amount of excitement I've seen online for this finish alone has been palpable. It's not as dark as the old school black MacBook. It's really more of a very, very dark gray. And you can see this by comparing the body of the MacBook Pro to the color of the keyboard. The keyboard is obviously black. And interestingly, Apple used a new chemistry process that's part of the anodization, specifically on the space black finish that reduces the appearance of fingerprints. And compared to the midnight colored MacBook Air, 
I'd say it works. Now here's how it looks next to the Space Gray M2 MacBook Pro for comparison. And also for those wondering how it compares to the midnight colored MacBook Air, here's a look at those side by side as well. It's actually pretty close. Space Black is a good color, better than Space Gray in my opinion, but I can definitely see why some would still choose the classic silver instead. The Magic Keyboard provides a responsive key feel while the industry leading force touch trackpad gives your fingers a smooth glass surface to interact with. For work in low light, the keyboard glyphs glow thanks to the uniform backlighting. The expanded escape key proves handy for developers rapidly switching contexts while the touch ID sensor enables fast and secure login and payments. Overall, the M3 Max MacBook Pro design strikes an ideal balance. The chassis remains light enough at just 4.8 pounds for true portability, yet extremely rigid thanks to the machined aluminum unibody construction. And that brings me to performance, which demonstrates how far beyond Intel Apple Silicon engineers are at this point. The 10 core CPU achieves up to 45% faster single and multi-threaded performance versus the already blisteringly quick M2 Max. Graphics power scales up to 40 cores in the particular machine I'm using, resulting in 30% faster rendering in apps like Octane, Redshift, and Resolve versus the M2 Max. The 16 core neural engine adds capabilities like video analysis and image processing accelerated by machine learning. New media engines enhance 8K video editing and ProRes transcoding performance alongside new AV1 decoding, which makes streaming video much more efficient. And the chip takes full advantage of the latest LPDDR5 memory and blazing NVMe SSD speeds. For real world results, tasks like code compiling, 3D rendering, and video export finish far faster, allowing users to iterate faster and focus more on creative output versus waiting on progress bars. Then of course, with the new GPU architecture, the arrival of hardware accelerated ray tracing also opens new possibilities for Mac gaming. Ray traced effects can make lighting, reflections, shadows, and textures in games far more realistic than traditional rasterization techniques. This creates much higher levels of immersion for gamers, and major game engines like Unity and Unreal Engine now support real-time ray tracing, so Mac versions of cutting-edge games will be able to take full advantage of the new M3 GPU architecture. Gamers can expect natural shadows, accurate light bounce from different materials, precise reflections that change perspective realistically, and overall, more photorealistic environments that heighten the feeling of presence in game. We know AAA titles like Resident Evil 4 Remake, Death Stranding, and The Division Resurgence are coming soon to the Mac. And don't be surprised if Assassin's Creed Mirage, which has been announced for iOS, comes to the Mac as well. And let's just hope the momentum continues to ramp up because now that the Mac hardware is capable, we just need the games to arrive that can take advantage of it. The M3 Max represents a new pinnacle of efficiency, capabilities, and pro-focused optimizations. For creators who push their laptop hardware to the limits, it's incredibly empowering. All right, next, let's talk battery life. The immense power efficiency of Apple's custom silicon allows this new MacBook Pro to continue to deliver game-changing battery life. For general productivity, web browsing, and streaming, you can unplug for nearly 15 hours on a single charge, which is an entire transcontinental flight with plenty of juice to spare. Now, even for more demanding creative workloads, this machine still clocks an incredible 12 hours on Tether. The 100 watt hour battery has the same capacity as before, but the M3 chips sip less power, allowing them to stretch it further. The 140 watt USB-C adapter can charge to 50% in just 30 minutes when using the included MagSafe cable, allowing you to maximize productivity even on brief pit stops. For example, a 15 minute coffee break would add several hours of unplugged runtime. This combination of extraordinary battery efficiency and quick charging fundamentally changes how you can use the MacBook Pro on the go. Oh, and if you just download a bunch of movies and watch those during a flight, you can get up to 22 hours of watch time from a single full battery charge. Then there's memory and storage. Previously, limited memory and storage forced Creative Pros to compromise which files or apps could be open simultaneously. Power users had to keep commonly accessed assets on external drives. With Apple Silicon, this has no longer been the case on the MacBook Pro with a Max chip thanks to best-in-class unified memory and SSD storage options. Let's start with the mind-blowing memory capacity. Configurations with the M3 Max chip can be equipped with up to 128 gigabytes of unified memory with 460 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. That's an unheard amount in a laptop. This allows Pro users to work with massive photo libraries in Photoshop, edit 8K video timelines, render complex 3D 
scenes and more without issue. Next, the Blazing Fast internal SSD storage enables responsively opening and editing large multi gigabyte files. Capacity scale all the way up to eight terabytes, allowing entire media libraries and projects to fit on the insanely fast internal storage. This combination of abundant super fast memory and storage eliminates workflow bottlenecks, allowing pros to realize their creative visions with fewer painful compromises imposed by hardware limitations. So for creators who really push their hardware to the limits with the most demanding workflows, the M3 Max does deliver meaningful gains that justify upgrading from M1 or even M2 based devices, depending on your workflow. But for many general prosumers, their current Apple Silicon Macs will satisfy their needs for years to come. But if you're running on a MacBook Pro that's powered by an Intel chip, now is the time. The M3 Max MacBook Pro is impressive in every way and the performance you get for the power draw is simply unmatched. This actually aligns well with Apple's overall brand ethos. And back to the original promise of this video, Apple focuses on building products so excellent at what they do that you don't need to upgrade them as frequently. So in that sense, the incredible staying power of the M1 and M2 chips is a feature, not a bug. It gives an even larger audience of Mac users access to no compromise Apple Silicon performance that will empower their creativity or productivity for many years. The M3 slides into this perfectly with the enhanced GPU and up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. Pick one up and you'll be good for years to come. In closing, this machine represents a new tier of Pro Notebook. Two months ago, the tech world buzzed with the launch of the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus. As we peel back the layers of Apple's latest offerings, we find ourselves asking, have these devices truly evolved beyond their predecessors or are they merely repackaged with minor tweaks? While much of the attention of the iPhone 15 launch has been focused on the Pro models, I think the devices that see the most changes this year are the 15 and 15 Plus. So let's talk about how the experience has been for the past 60 days. And for those already thinking of getting one, check out the link in the description below. Starting with the design, the iPhone 15 series brings more than just aesthetic changes. The new color palette introduces a kind of refreshing twist, diverging from the typical hues we've seen in the past. Each color has its own unique sheen, reflecting light in a way that makes the phone stand out, yet retain its classic Apple elegance, for lack of a better word. Now, I know some people are gonna say these colors are very muted, and I do agree. In some lights, a lot of the colors look just plain white, especially that blue one. But if you're into either black or pastels, this is the year for you. The build quality too speaks volumes of Apple's attention to detail. The ceramic shield front cover is tough, promising resilience against those accidental drops. I haven't dropped mine yet, so I don't have personal experience, but Apple's been using it for a few years now and it has held up great. The precision milled back glass adds to the durability while keeping the iPhone surprisingly light in the hand. That's also thanks to the aluminum build and why I've always been such a fan of the non-pro iPhones, just due to how light and easy they are to carry around, at least until this year with the titanium iPhone 15 Pro. Ergonomically, the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus feel secure and comfortable, striking a balance between a robust build and a sleek design. The slightly altered dimensions and weight distribution make for a noticeable improvement for in-hand feel especially during extended use. Then there's the display on the iPhone 15 series, and this is where Apple really flexes those muscles. The display has a nice high pixel density and HDR support, which makes everything from photos to videos look stunningly vivid. The brightness levels are also impressive this year, hitting 2000 nits, allowing for clear visibility even under direct sunlight. But I think the star of the show for a lot of people this year is going to be the dynamic island. This feature transforms the notch into an interactive, multifunctional space. The Dynamic Island made its debut last year on the iPhone 14 Pro, and this year comes down to the non-pro models. And this is not just an area for notifications. It dynamically changes shape and function based on what you're doing, be it tracking your music, showing timer countdowns, or even integrating with third-party apps like My Favorite Flighty to see what's going on with the flight I'm on or upcoming flights or what my friends are up to or sports scores. The Dynamic Island does it all without disrupting your screen space. And the real beauty of the Dynamic Island lies in its integration with iOS 17. It's a seamless extension of the user interface, 
almost like an organism responding to your interactions. This feature is a perfect blend of utility and elegance and also a cool way of taking what would be otherwise unused space and turning it into something useful. The overall user experience is further enhanced by the responsiveness of that screen. It's an LCD that supports 60 frames per second, but the touch sensitivity is finely tuned to provide a fluid and intuitive interface. Navigating through menus, swiping through apps and playing games, the display responds with a level of precision that feels almost predictive. All right, next, let's talk about these cameras. The iPhone 15 series introduces a 48 megapixel main camera, a leap forward in Apple's camera technology compared to the previous models that were stuck at 12 megapixels for several years. Now this new sensor is not just about higher resolution, it's about capturing more details and better light gathering, enhancing every shot. The quad pixel sensor is a game changer, enabling super high resolution photos that bring an incredible level of detail, particularly in well lit conditions. The sensor elevates the iPhone's photography game, allowing users to capture moments with clarity and precision that you never could before on a non-pro iPhone. With the new 48 megapixel camera, the iPhone 15 offers a default 24 megapixel resolution. The Photonic Engine, which is Apple's latest image processing technology, plays a pivotal role here. It combines the strengths of the 48 megapixel sensor with Apple's advanced algorithms, delivering photos with exceptional quality. And the result is images with vibrant colors and striking details, maintaining excellent performance even in challenging lighting conditions. Now the 2X telephoto feature is another significant change. It's an addition. By utilizing the middle 12 megapixels of that 48 megapixel sensor, the iPhone 15 provides optical quality 2X telephoto for photos and videos. This feature offers a 52 millimeter focal length, which is ideal for portraits and closer shots. And it incorporates the same advanced features as the main camera, since it is using the main camera, including a fast F1.6 aperture and sensor shift optical image stabilization, both of which ensure sharp and steady shots, even when zoomed in. Of course, there's still the ultra wide and selfie cameras, but those pretty much work as they always have. And for me, the big changes to the camera system are really enabled by that main 48 megapixel sensor, which gives you the addition of having a telephoto without needing that third physical lens to do so. Next, let's talk performance. At the heart of the iPhone 15 series is the A16 Bionic chip. It's the same found in last year's iPhone 14 Pro. The chip isn't just about raw speed, it's also about efficiency. Whether you're gaming, streaming, or simply navigating through your day, the A16 Bionic handles it all with an ease that feels almost effortless. iOS 17 brings a slew of new features and optimizations that complement the hardware perfectly. The interface is cleaner, the animation smoother, and the overall experience just more cohesive. Battery life, often a pain point for smartphone users, is an area where the iPhone 15 excels, especially on the Plus model. The efficiency of the A16 Bionic coupled with a slightly larger battery translates to great usage times. Even on days with heavy usage, you're likely to have enough juice to get through the day without reaching for the charger. The optimization of the battery's health over time ensures that the iPhone retains its charging capacity longer, making it not just a device for today, but also for years to come. In terms of connectivity, the iPhone 15 series took a pretty significant stride forward with a transition to USB-C from Lightning. This offers additional ways to transfer data, additional ways to connect to peripherals. You may also think faster data transfer, but that part didn't change. You're still getting USB 2.0 speeds here, but the change to USB-C is still appreciate it's a welcome change for users who have long waited for a universal charging solution to be added to the iphone apple's dedication to user safety is further exemplified in the emergency sos via satellite feature this was introduced last year and this technology is a lifeline in situations where traditional cellular networks are unavailable it's designed to connect you to emergency services when you're off the grid providing an essential safety net for adventurers and travelers alike. Additionally, the new inclusion of roadside assistance via satellite takes this feature to the next level. Whether you're stranded with a broken down car or in need of immediate assistance in remote areas, this service is just a few taps away on your iPhone 15. The ultra wideband chip is a hidden gem allowing for precise location tracking 
and enhance experiences with accessories like AirTags and smart home devices. It's utilizing Apple's second generation ultra wideband chip. And when trying to find another device with that same second gen chip, you can actually use precision finding starting up to three times further away. After two months with the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus, it's clear that these are more than just incremental updates. They represent a thoughtful evolution in the non-pro iPhone lineage, combining cutting edge technology with user-centric design. So the question is who should consider upgrading? If you value a nice blend of aesthetic performance and camera prowess, the iPhone 15 series is worth your attention. These devices are tailored for those who seek the latest in technology without breaking the bank or compromising on usability and style. Three months, 90 days, over 2,000 hours. That's how long I've been living with the iPhone 15 Pro Max, Apple's latest flagship smartphone. And today I'm sharing my favorite standout features. From capturing life's unexpected moments in stunning clarity, to navigating the hustle of daily tasks with unmatched ease. The first two weeks with the iPhone 15 Pro Max showed that the device is a beast. But was it just the initial hype or does the iPhone 15 Pro truly stand the test of time? Let's talk about it, starting with this design. This year on the Pro line of iPhones, we're getting an all new titanium material. That's right, stainless steel has been retired and in its place is an aerospace grade titanium alloy that frames the sides of the iPhone 15 Pro devices. This creates the most durable iPhone build yet while keeping them incredibly lightweight. Seriously, these iPhones feel so much lighter in the hand, which was my main complaint about the iPhone 12, 13, and 14 Pro devices. The titanium alloy allows the border widths to be shrunk down, so we also have the thinnest bezels ever on an iPhone. And I know a lot of people are obsessed with bezels and will be happy to hear that. Apple then used those smaller bezels to shrink the dimensions of the iPhone instead of keeping them the same and making the screen marginally larger. And I think that was definitely the right move. And paired with those new contoured edges, the iPhone 15 Pros feel noticeably slimmer in the hand and much more comfortable to use. But it's not just about aesthetics. The internal redesign also utilizes 100% recycled aluminum for improved repairability. So you get a more sustainable iPhone that's easier to repair and built to last. Next. Let's talk about the all new action button. I did a full video on this already because for me, this is one of the most exciting features on the iPhone in a long time. This customizable button takes the place of the traditional mute switch that's been on the iPhone since the very beginning. The thing is, most people I know just set that toggle to mute and leave it there until they upgrade their phone, making it kind of pointless to a lot of people. Why have a switch that someone uses just once for the entire life of the device? Now we have a button that allows you to customize your iPhone 15 Pro to do exactly what you want it to do. The default behavior is still to quickly silence your phone with a press and hold, but now you can swap this out for more useful function based on your needs. Other options include launching the camera app from anywhere for quicker shots, turning on the flashlight instantly from your pocket, or enabling a preset focus mode like work or reading with a press. For users with accessibility needs, the action button is a game changer. It can be set to instantly enable things like live speech to read text aloud or the magnifier as a visual aid. For even more power, you can use the action button to run shortcuts. That means you can use it to open any app of your choosing or to run a series of commands in an app or even your smart home. I think this is truly a game changer and is the perfect evolution of the classic silent switch. Next, let's dive into the camera features. Let's talk about the leaps in camera hardware and software that make the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max so great for mobile photography. Built into the camera app are seven built-in focal lengths through computational photography, making the camera super versatile. Now I've seen some people online saying you're getting several different lenses, but that isn't the case. You still have three, but you can choose to crop into 1.2X and 1.5X for 28 and 35 millimeter equivalents respectively. The main 48 megapixel camera now captures even finer details at a crisp 24 megapixel resolution by default by taking a binned 12 megapixel image with the larger quad pixels for great low light detail 
and combining with the full 48 megapixel image with individual pixels so it picks up all the detail. Apple's Photonic Engine then goes to work applying Deep Fusion, Smart HDR, and the entire image processing pipeline to give you excellent 24 megapixel photos with zero shutter lag. Of course, if you prefer the 12 megapixel images, you can just switch it up in settings, but I wouldn't. Another big one in the camera this year is 48 megapixel Heath. That's high efficiency image format. This allows you to take a full 48 megapixel image at a tremendously smaller file size five megabytes versus 75 megabytes when shooting a 48 megapixel shot in Pro Raw. Of course, videos taken on the iPhone 15 Pro continue to be industry leading as it pertains to quality as well. Whether you're using the camera for photos or video, you'll come away happy with the results. Now for me personally, the coolest camera feature on these new iPhones, both the 15 and 15 Pro, is the fact that when taking a picture, if it detects a person, dog, or cat, it'll automatically capture all the depth data, allowing you to change it into a portrait mode photo later after the fact. You can also do this by manually tapping on a subject in your photo as well. But the coolest part of all this is that you can even change the focal point of a photo later. This is like the holy grail of photo editing. And thanks to the power of computational photography, it's here in your iPhone. Now, everything I just mentioned applies to both the 15 Pro and Pro Max, but the iPhone 15 Pro Max boasts the biggest innovation. A Tetra Prism design enables a telephoto lens that achieves a 5X optical zoom range, giving you a 120 millimeter focal length with an f2.8 aperture enabling great close-ups from afar. Paired with a new 3D sensor shift image stabilization technology, even shots at full zoom stay crisp and steady as the sensor shift module moves in all three directions for the first time on any smartphone. This provides up to 10,000 micro adjustments per second, which is twice as many as the iPhone 14 Pro Max. Also for the first time, the Pro camera system meets the demands of professional filmmakers. Capturing log encoded ProRes video to external SSD drives enables cinema grade post-production workflows without having to eat into your iPhone storage. One other note as it pertains to the camera, iOS 17.2 just dropped yesterday, which adds in something called spatial video recording. Now spatial video recording uses your main camera lens and the ultra wide together to record videos in 3D. These can then be viewed in 3D on the Apple Vision Pro. But I've been using an app called Spatialify, which makes them compatible with this, this is the MetaQuest 3. And until Apple Vision Pro is released, this is the next best thing. And even on this, those videos are truly amazing. And it's profound enough that I recommend you shoot all of your personal videos with your loved ones in spatial if you have an iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max. It's that good. And you're gonna to wanna to be able to watch that content in this new immersive format going forward into the future. Now, powering all these new capabilities is the beastly new a17 Pro chip. It's a whole new architecture built on a three nanometer process with improvements to the CPU, GPU, and neural engine. The six core CPU is up to 10% faster thanks to these architectural improvements, making it the fastest CPU in any smartphone and rivaling speeds found even in desktop PCs. But the real news is the all new six core GPU. It introduces a totally redesigned architecture that amplifies graphics and gaming capabilities to levels never before seen in a smartphone. Demands of professional workflows like ProRes video and the new 48 megapixel camera output are easily met with dedicated imaging and video pipelines and bleeding edge gaming features like hardware-based ray tracing create console quality visuals on an iPhone for the first time. Let me just say that playing Resident Evil Village on a smartphone at this quality was insane. I can't wait to see how other games like Death Stranding, and especially Assassin's Creed Mirage look with the power of the A17 Pro behind them. Next, I'm sure you were wondering how long it was gonna take me to get to it, but hey, Apple left us waiting on this one for years. It's the new USB-C port with high-speed connectivity, replacing the tried and true Lightning port. While convenient for compatibility with other Apple products and having a universal wired charging port built in, the biggest benefits are enjoyed by professional users here too. External storage and peripherals hook up effortlessly for fast, pro-grade workflows. With support for USB 3.2 Gen 2 data speeds, transferring huge files is incredibly fast 
We're talking 10 gigabits per second, thanks to the new USB controller inside the A17 Pro chip. That's 20 times faster than what you'd see on last year's iPhone 14 Pro. You also get display port here, so you can plug into a monitor and output 4K at 60 frames per second in HDR. And side note, that doesn't just apply to the 15 Pro, but you can also do that with the standard iPhone 15 as well. The iPhone 15 Pro also picks up some additional features like Wi-Fi 6E, giving us an ultra modern, fast Wi-Fi standard at six gigahertz, which also allows for two times faster airdrop with other 6E devices. There's a thread radio in the iPhone that will allow you to connect directly to thread devices in your home without the need for a hub. That functionality is coming soon. And a second generation ultra wideband chip with three times farther range, which enables you to use precision finding in Find My Friends. Oh, and in addition to last year's emergency SOS via satellite, this year, Apple is adding roadside assistance via satellite so that you can contact help if you're stranded with no cellular service. So after three months, the iPhone 15 Pro Max has stood the test of time for me. It may not be a revolution, but it's an evolution that speaks volumes. While Android enthusiasts have long enjoyed features like USB-C, the iPhone 15 Pro brings these much awaited capabilities to Apple loyalists. It's not just about catching up, it's about how Apple integrates these features into its well-loved ecosystem. And sure, to be clear, you might find phones with superior zoom or multitasking prowess elsewhere, but the iPhone 15 Pro marks a significant moment for those ingrained in the iOS world. Some may say it's a blend of external influences from market competition to regulatory pressures that have sculpted this iPhone into something more refined, more attuned to consumer needs. So whether you're a diehard Apple fan or an onlooker from the other side, there is something to appreciate here. The iPhone 15 Pro stands as a testament to progress shaped by the world around it into a device that's distinctly iPhone, yet undeniably improved. Thanks for watching as always, guys. I appreciate your support. I'm Andrew Webers, and I will catch you in the next video.